right, everyone. So I'm really excited to have a close friend of mine, uh, Daniel Salabak. He is from Romania. And we're going to go over a whole bunch of books that he, I don't want to say painstakingly read. You've covered a whole bunch since you and I last talked. I can't wait. I'm about to give you the floor. I'm about to hand the torch to you. Can you just really quickly, before we jump into the weeds of this, two things. One, uh, this is all Peter Moon books, am I correct? No, he has a big part of to play in this, but it's uh, Radu Cinamar, who is a Romanian, and Peter Moon's affiliation has to do with making them more famous by translating them. Well, not personally, but he had someone translate them and made them basically famous in the U.S. and elsewhere through, you know, English being more popular. And for yeah. everyone that, that is just looking at a whole bunch of titles that are like, what the hell are we staring at? Can you tell them what all this has to do with? What are all these books trying to allude to? Well, it's called the Transylvanian series, but really it's the first few cover the most incredible finding of any kind, not just archaeological, uh, in the history of humanity. And I'm going to go in more detail later. Uh, th that part is also pretty well covered by Peter Moon. But the fifth and sixth book go really off the wall with the information because he gets more and more clearance into this program and he gets more and more access to information that incredible technologies and stuff you won't believe. Like that has to do with the history of humanity and what's inside the earth, things like this. Yeah, what's, what's really inside the earth? Because the earth is more honeycomb and there's lots of deep caverns that tons of civilizations, including the government, has taken advantage of that they do not want us to know. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Daniel tell us about everything he's learned. So please go ahead. Well, I know also gonna add that the honeycomb theory is uh, the most, uh, you know, tentative one. It's pretty much obvious to anyone who's into the UFO subject that there is such a thing as the inner earth, but this goes even much deeper than that. But until then, we have a lot of stuff to cover. So I'm just gonna go through the bare essentials of it. This is a series and his name is Radu Cinamar, but just by the name, it's clearly not even Romanian. And it turns out it's a palindrome and it translates to a Romanians with the gift. So that's, I don't know, some cryptic thing. And this is the first in the book called Translating Sarites, although it's not really the Romanian title. And that's an image of the Sphinx. So I'm going to go chronologically to the book because it will make the most sense. So it starts with the introduction of the main character, at least in this book, who is Cesar Brad. And his birth, he's a very special person, as was made very clear by Peter Moon as well. His birth where he had a ginormous umbilical cord, uh, 1.5 meters, and all sorts of anomalies from beginning to today. He's still alive. He was born in 1970. And as soon as he was born, there were military, like many black types, that came and dissolved all the documentation that would have been made so that he would be invisible. He was targeted from basically as soon as he was born. And just a quick example of his psychic ability, because that was what made him the target. So when he was in first or second grade, his class had to memorize some poems, and he was caught looking outside at the window while the other people were studying the poems. And when he was accosted by the teacher, he said that he had already memorized a poem when she first read it. And then uh, she was kind of intrigued by this, so she had him recite it, and he did it without any flaw. And afterwards, just to further test the boy, she had him memorize on the spot two more poems. So that's called eidetic memory, something like this, where you, you don't need to inculcate, you just on the fly memorize everything. And another phenomenon that happened was when he could go out of body, he could induce out of body experiences from a very early age, and uh, one time after school, so in his early teens, he crossed his legs on the bed and went into a deep trance and then found himself floating half a meter above the bed. And then his mother entered the room and he got startled and cried out and the boy fell and kind of hurt himself. But yeah, that was when they first got visited by the military men. And if not then, then soon after they would take him away from home. I'm not going to go into more of his home life. Anyway, he was recruited into this type of, I guess the closest thing is like an X-Men or something, maybe like Montauk without the torture, a uh, place where they would try to foster these psychically gifted kids, psychonauts, I guess. And another two quick examples was one kid was able to move objects, I think that's telekinesis, and also 
physically affect them. So like he would crumple paper or uh, he even lifted uh, a sphere of water. And another guy who could predict time at first up to eight to 10 hours ahead. So predict events. And he got entrained so that he could extend that to 28 hours. We later find out that the kid died soon after and other kids like that. Then the next thing that was interesting in this book, I guess, is so he got recruited into this later on, Department Zero, which is, I don't know if I can find an equivalent, but yeah, it's, they were tasked with finding anomalies in Romania and they had very high clearance. They only had to answer to the president. Yeah, it's, it's almost like some sort of a, not as clandestine if they're answering to the president, but roughly equivalent in the United States, like a FBI or a CIA. That's Romania's version of a tight under wraps kind of deal. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, but much less clandestine. I mean, yes, much yes. less nefarious. And only really had good intentions. I mean, I, I don't want to seem like I'm, uh, you know, wide-eyed or anything, but at least they didn't disclose anything. I'm, I'm convinced that they didn't have ill intentions and worked against these more negative entities all throughout their existence. So anyway, one of the first major cases that they were tasked with, and by the way, Cesar was a big part of them, with this group from the beginning, was in Buzo, which are mountains at the curvature of the Carpats mountains, which are which dominate Romania. And there were two brothers who climbed this cliff, and two thirds of the way up, they found the inscriptions that were uh, unrecognizable. They took pictures, and no one could make out what they were. And anyway, they got to the summit, and they found a golden lever. And one of the guys pulled it, and all of a sudden, he dematerialized. He went completely elsewhere. And yeah, he was startled, the other guy. And obviously, people fingered him as the killer, the remaining guy. But their father was also a mountain climber and did the exact same thing as the guy who disappeared. So he pulled the lever and he completely dematerialized. Not even a special effect, he just went. And also, the second time around when the father went, this was witnessed by some 10 people. And it induced a little bit of panic, as you can imagine. And yeah, they have to go there and settle things down. And it wasn't their doing, but later on, the place was dynamited. So you can't even find it now. But they did take pictures. I guess they did that because they were scared and it was such a novel thing, I guess. Okay, and now I'm going to jump a lot of chapters and get to... So Cezar quickly jumped ranks. He got to technical director at 21, which was unheard of. But he had great trust from the Colonel Obadia, who was the leader, only had to answer President Ceausescu at the time. And anyway, I'm going to jump to the Bucic connection now. So there's a guy, a Freemason called Massini, Senor Massini, in Italian, but he could speak Romanian. And he got in touch directly, jumped all the hoops with Cesar Brad as if there was no security, which there was a lot of. And he was the first who explained to him about this. Um, so very advanced satellites back in 2002 scanned the entire world and they found extreme anomalies that were the same more or less in Iraq, namely dome shaped like half sphere and they couldn't penetrate it at all. And it had other strange characteristics like it was linked to a tunnel that then had a long way to go before being linked to the outside. So it was like it was, you know, put there just to confound people. And also, it had the exact same, I don't know, frequency that couldn't be penetrated anymore. So there was a clear anomaly there that couldn't be man-made at all or nature. It was some intelligence at play. And the Mason wanted to be the first to claim that place. And also, interestingly enough, around the time they found out was when the Iraq war started. So I don't know if it's linked, but it could very well be. Because... Uh, this also gained entry to Romania in, into NATO very easily. So kind of drew some, you know, question marks there. And he explained to uh, Cesar Vrad, uh, Massini, about the masonry and how they control everything, even if, you know, it doesn't seem so. And everyone's in their pocket. And if they're not, they're going to be eventually, or they're going to get rid of that person. And he draws a very bleak picture that there are actually three layers to Freemasonry. He goes in deep detail, which I'm not going to cover here, except to say that, so the first is the very superficial, like doctors and such, politicians maybe, which do stuff, but never get information about them, about the Masons, secret stuff, occult stuff. 
Then the second layer is what you would know as the normal program, which is 33 degrees. But that's just also an illusion of power because then comes the third layer where they're all actually chummy. So they just act like they're in opposition. And that's where the real power comes in. And he was offering Cesar a very high position in the second layer and basically giving him no other option in, you know. But he managed to like juggle the situation. It was very tenuous. So anyway, so this is just a picture of the approximation of the place. It's under a very famous landmark in Romania, not far from Bucharest. And also, there was a lot of chaos behind the scenes as soon as the Romanians got wind of this information. And they wanted to disclose because they didn't know how deep the controller's reach was. So there was a lot of chaos, basically. And Americans flew in the second day and a lot of infighting and outfighting. And even the Pope came in and also was anti-disclosure and said that they should be prudent and that if you're going to play ball, he was going to give Romanians access to very old tablets and language that was obscured intentionally, that would be very valuable to Romanian identity. Okay, and this is the shape of the energy shield that surrounded it, that they felt on the satellite. And there were actually initially, it was surrounded by 200 military men. It was very well guarded from the beginning. No one could have gotten in without permission, not even on the first day, so don't even dream of such scenarios. And initially, there were three deaths from people who tried to enter the energy half sphere without, you know, thinking. So yeah, those guys rushed it and they died. And it was only when Cesar, who is way more intuitive as we established, he went in smoothly. And basically it was a barrier of your, you heard this frequency of vibration or whatever. It's kind of overused, but it was a level of your test of your level of consciousness which is a thing that is measurable after all. And they had the guys who put this in place, this type of advanced technology. And so these are the measurements of the room itself, 30 meters tall and 20 meters just to the energy shield and the cool devices inside it. So they had very advanced boring machines, but whatever, it's kind of excessive. So anyway, this is the inside of the room looking from above. And there were five T-shaped tables like this on each side, so 10 total. At the opposite end of the room, there were three tunnels, one that led to Egypt, underground also. The last one led to Tibet, and the middle one led to Inner Earth. And in the middle, there were a couple of other notable devices. So first of all, at the beginning, Radu Chinamar, who now we switched from his perspective the story, because the point about him being allowed inside was to make this all popular but in a you know slower and more adjustable tempo so this was his only purpose so he was given a few hours a few days after they investigated everything themselves the scientists and cesar so this is the amazing tech part that's quite popular already but anyway i'm going to cover it so when you walk by one of these tables which had inscriptions of an unknown language on their sides So they were five meters long. They were very long, I think. They would appear a hologram that was two meters wide and 2.5 meters tall, I believe. And it was basically like you were in there. It was perfect image, perfect resolution. You would have to climb with a small ladder. And it would project the hologram as soon as you would walk by it. And uh, each of the 10 tables represented another branch of science. So there was one with biology. There was one with just the original technology, one with astrology, one with religion, which is weird, but so yeah. Oh, and one that covered various races of non-human beings and a couple of others that is keeping right now. Anyway, so our guy Radu walked by the biology one and managed to investigate a little bit. And he saw rotating quickly images of flora and fauna, many of which he didn't recognize. And he went and touched the grid because the table, which was smooth and smoky, like a black marble, he touched the grid, which had squares in it, and he noticed a human body that appeared instead, and he was also rotating, and he noticed that it was his body because of a mark on his hand or arm, and it would circle him, although he wouldn't move, and he noticed that when he would move his finger forward, it would zoom into his body, down to the organs, and this was in real time. He would notice changes and zoom in more and more until he reached 
the DNA and then the even atomic level, which eludes our current day science. And he played around with this. He was amazed. So he even saw like what we described as kind of energetic clouds that would change colors, which were linked between them. So he went into incredible detail there, more than he would make heads or tails of. And he explored other buttons, I mean, other surfaces, and then other creatures appeared. And then he combined two fingers at the same time. And what appeared was the most likely hybridization, complete with all the genetic code on the side in the unknown language, vertically. And we were showing the most likely combination genetically of the two species. And so that was all he could have access to tables-wise at the beginning. This would change later on, but anyway. Then the main event of this room was another projection-like device, but this time in the shape of a dome, it was pretty low, and he was in the center of the room for this. And he was also just approach it, and what would come out is an hour and a half long hologram of the history of the Earth. And it was also intuitive in the sense that he would adjust it to his personality and thoughts. I'm going to go into more depth into how you get to control this tech through your mind as we get into the other books. So basically, the gist of this vision that he had, or whatever, is that it was completely shocking. At the time, he couldn't disclose too much because it was still early days. But what he said was that 90% of history is completely revisionistic at best. And or just completely, you know, manipulated beyond recognition. And as far as myths and legends, it's the exact opposite. Ninety percent of them are true, but through various phenomena, we got, you know, distorted. There was also a control panel that showed that after the last big flood, most of the water that occupied at least a huge chunk of Europe, where Hungary and Romania is, just got vortexed inside of a well-known mountain in Romania is called Godiano. And there was a nice trick that whenever a huge event happened, it, the camera would pan out of the earth and it would show the surrounding stars. And that's how you could exactly pinpoint the time when these events happened because of platonic years, which take 26,000 years. And this is how they figured out that the construction in Bucej Mountains under was uh, around 50 to 55,000 years old. So obviously way older than agriculture and anything like that. Not that it matters. Anyway, that about is a quick summary of the first book. And the second book, which I won't spend too much time on because it is actually better than the first, but it's more about the narrative and dialogue and things like this than about the technology. So the author gets contacted by this mysterious guy who turns out to be an alchemist. He looks 26, 27, but it tells him he's actually 62. He's also from Romania. He lives in a villa. And he had an ancestor contact him because he was the last in his line. This ancestor was born in sometime in 13 or 1400s. And basically, he had this device that prolonged his life by like a factor of 20 or something. And that's without further manipulation, because this is all alchemy is, uh, is avoiding, you know, the reset trap that we're in. So how we forget everything, amnesia, when we reincarnate on Earth, <clears throat> this is the best gift that you can be given to not forget, to be able to bypass this process. And he showed him his device. It was a mesh metal square, and inside it was a mesh sphere, and inside it was a tetrahedron, or the most basic pyramid shape. And that one was of some rare diamond, and that was, I think, tantamount to the Philosopher's Stone. And he goes into detail about his ancestor, how he got this device himself when he was kidnapped by some Arabian guys, and he was the acolyte of a magician and after 20 something years he was given this device and then he spent hundreds of years studying the subject because you have to study a lot in alchemy you have to do your own research and really really esoteric that you're not going to find and this is why you need hundreds of years to perfect it and a famous one is saint germain mm -hmm. if you want to look more into this subject although it was said he lived a normal lifespan but we never know and then he mentions how suicide is the most, you know, unfortunate thing you can do because there is such a thing as karma and you basically nullify your entire progress that you had in that particular lifetime. So even if you're up against it, yeah, there's a few pages about how you shouldn't commit suicide. And the first third of the book covers this guy and his relationship 
And we next get introduced to a Tibetan Lama called Repa Sundi, who turns out, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, he lives in 4D, basically. And this is the first time I'm going to mention 4D, but it's going to be a recurring theme. So 4D is the etheric plane. I mean, all the schools of thought that map out the different dimensions kind of agree that the etheric is the one that's above physical. And then you have contention points about whether the next one is astral or lower astral or higher etheric, whatever. The point is, it's the 4D that we know from every extraterrestrial race that travels here. So you have to go into 4D because otherwise you, you would only be going this field of light. And that's the information we get from navigators who are humans. And he was very telepathic. This was the first time we get introduced to a really psychically gifted person, even more so than Cesar. And yeah, he not just could, could also synthesize the person who was speaking with the train of thought. So yeah, it was pretty intimidating. And he had a creature that you would summon that is in Tibetan folklore called a Idam, Y-I-D-A-M. And he basically, the guy who he would uh, spawn, it would be very complex. It would take decades to master this. And there are many types of them. In this case, it was protective. So you made him and he was kind of like, he was almost to the level of a god. So he's very powerful. At the same time, he was a creation of another person's imagination. So he had his limits. So you would have to tread carefully and not get too, you know, immersed. And he was skeptical at first, but he had him talk to him and he, he sounded completely otherworldly. And the things he told him convinced him it was the real deal. And I know this sounds fantastical, but it's completely consistent from A to Z, the book. And the Lama wanted to contact the main character, Radu, to basically initiate him because he was impressed by the first book. He wanted to initiate him into sort of further, more powerful type of awakening or whatever, disclosure or just leveling up of the planet. And so he took him in Apusen Mountains, which also are very significant because in the vision, in the original hologram of the history of the Earth, one of the main key points was that old time people of Romania around 9,000 years ago were the only real community left on earth, which means that they repopulated the entire rest of the earth. So even the Upanishads describe, well, I know this one is even for me, it's kind of hard to wrap my mind around, but it does describe flora and fauna that is not findable in India, but it, it matches perfectly Romania. That's just an aside. And he gradually teleported him because he didn't want to shock Radu. So the landscape around him would slowly morph into a completely different one, kind of through a fisheye lens, until it changed completely. And they found themselves in the uh, mountains of Tibet from Romania. And there he entered a cave through which only he had access. And he went in and he met this, well, would you believe it? That's what is described in the book, a goddess, who actually is like an ascended master. It would maybe be a better description because she was also a human some a few thousand years ago and yeah got upgraded or something but she was called makandi or machandi I'm not sure she was blue skinned and she completely blew radu's mind and he became completely besotted with her because her completely perfectly harmonious features and face and just presence aura she was blue skinned she had yellow eyes and green irises and she looked slightly Asian, but also her eyes were slightly almondy. And she talked to him. And when she would speak, it would clearly be another language, but he would understand every word. And it would sound as if different people are talking like in a harmony, make a harmony. And she gave him an upgrade, actually three. One on the throat chakra, she touched it. And then he describes in detail how he fell off his feet. He could barely stand up. Then she touched his forehead, which is the sixth chakra, third eye. And yeah, he felt this explosion of emotion. Then she touched his crown chakra. And that one just, you know, made him so he couldn't even feel his body anymore. It was only through her support that he managed to stay awake through this process. She basically helped him not faint. And she told him that he has this mission. He's giving him a mission about restoring and making popular a few old time parchments from the Tibetan culture that were left by, you know, wise acres or whatever. And this is more covered in the fourth book. So anyway, the, the book ends with the end of the initiation where they're taken on Kodiano mountain, which is the place where I told you that the flood 
went uh, inside the Earth. But we all know that there are huge bodies of water inside Earth. It's not a huge piece of news. And also, there were a group of 19, I think, young men and women between 20 and 25 of Romanian origin. And they also were part of this initiation. And they joined the group with the Tibetan Lama and the author of the book and the Yidam. I forget if Eleanor was there, the alchemist. And as soon as they got further up the mountain, which they were told to do, a huge storm brewed and dark clouds clustered around the summit. And this is the purpose of the Idam, is to protect them. And then there were a few rabid dogs that wanted to jump at them, but the Idam cast some sort of protection spell, and that pretty much held the dogs, like it petrified them. And they got up the mountain, they met Makandi again, and this time she came out of a cave. She didn't even walk, she just floated and talked to them. And when she would address them, that's why I told you before that it would sound like different voices and she would, could address all of them personally. And they gave him messages about their purpose on the planet in the coming years. And it says that there's stuff that he can't disclose because it's a little too personal. Oh, and also when the Idam did that spell, it created a force field around them that completely protected them even from the storm. So you wouldn't get any wetness on the ground. And basically that's the end. Oh, and also a huge uh, like group of very beautiful and happy looking ETs because they had different shapes, faces descended through the storm. So there was also a separation of the storm from the skies, not just from the ground. And yeah, they kind of extended their uh, welcome or something. It ends kind of cryptically. But uh, so next up, we're getting back to the technology end of things. So Mystery of Egypt is the third book. And it covers the tunnel that I mentioned, the first one that goes to Egypt. So first of all, they got this very advanced tech because the Radu got to, to go only on like the third trip there. They already went there through normal means. And this is the devices. I mean, not this, but it's a prototype that I found that's similar to what I imagined it. Electric vehicles that they could traverse the tunnel, which, by the way, the tunnel was completely straight, except for the very beginning. And it basically didn't even exist if you were to scan it in the normal 3D, because it kind of punched a hole through space-time. This is unlike the other two tunnels, which are physical. So from this, they gathered that it was the last tunnel to be made. Oh, and not just the tunnels, but also the projection room itself has no microbes, no dust, no anything, because it's covered by a film of slightly radiating, but not so it's hurtful, and also kind of organic looking material that they only identified a small amount of uh, the materials involved, if any. And that would act like an antiseptic. So this story gets quickly interrupted in the book by a quick description of the old time people in Romania that he saw because by the third book, he he was given more and more license to share. And he describes people that very closely match what we know as Anunnaki. And it doesn't mention them by name until the sixth book, but yeah, it's hard to miss from the spot, which doesn't presuppose that they are full-blooded, but they certainly are high percentage from the looks of it because they are about two meters tall the people of Romania that would live on the slopes of mountains and hills of 9,000 years ago. There were very sparse communities of them, and they pretty much were the cradle of civilization. So it describes their looks. They were very glowing and white-skinned. They were generally blonde, and the guys had beards, and they would subsist on mainly bees, agriculture, and sheep, because, you know, sheep is good for a lot of things. Anyway, they were extremely meditative extremely contemplative and more spiritually advanced than us. Also quicker, like their mental acuity was better. So just because they didn't have this tech that we think is so advanced, doesn't mean that they weren't ahead of us. So, and it describes how they would lay on the ground for hours on end, just thinking, and this was the royal of life. And then when they would come home, they would embrace for a very long period. And their houses were very, very simple huts. They wouldn't even have doors, but they would have the shape of a door and the windows. And they also would be illuminated without any technology, just by their will and a very pleasant life. And the vision ends with, they are in a circle, nine of them, four men or, and five women or vice versa. They were holding hands and meditating one night and a huge vertical light comes out. I think it was golden. And one by one, they each dematerialize. 
at the end of the meditation. And this was kind of, you know, the tantalizing bit of information, but this is nothing compared to what's to come. But still, I thought it was worth mentioning because it confirms things. So this was only covered in one page, but I thought it was very worthwhile. One of the guys who went on this third Egypt trip was very, very specialized and you would not find anyone on the street going there. And one of the guys was a Pentagon technician who looked no older than 30. His name was Aiden and he was like a computer whiz and he showed the main character here a laptop that was used to actually navigate this tunnel and room that they would get to eventually because I told you it wasn't even shown up by radar or anything like that. So this completely self-made, I mean, he gave the instructions of how to make this laptop. And this was in 2005, might I add, this expedition. The first time they got into this room was 2003. And the last book appeared in 2020, so it's still very much an ongoing series. So it's nice. So this laptop, basically, instead of opening up like this, it would just slide, the, you would slide the screen and then it would appear like, I guess, Minority Report is the closest connection. So you would have a screen, but it would project a hologram and the menu would be completely in 3D and it would respond instantaneously. Sometimes he wouldn't even get to the destination before he would change completely the landscape of the menu. So this is to say that, in other words, this is what my conclusion was that it's even more advanced than the tech that, uh, you know, the very advanced race left behind in the first book, because that one, when you would interact with the table, it would be two-dimensional. And this guy found a way to, you know, incorporate another axis, which is the Z-axis. And yeah, he was very nimble. He said this was his whole life. Anyway, they would get into this room at the end, which is the only room that has any connection with anything else, unlike the other tunnels. And it's much smaller than the other one. Yeah, it says here, it's 10 meters long and seven meters high. And also it had a less, fewer devices, but still it had some amazing things. The first one, which is kind of the least impressive, but still amazing, is this anti-grav platform that was in case, just encased in gold. But here is a little crystal, a blue crystal, and here you would stand on it. And it's basically like a flying carpet. Oh, and it levitated already as soon as they found it. And the main character didn't have too much trouble you know, manning it. But it did take some explaining from Cesar, who was joining him on this trip, that you would have to concentrate all your focus on this crystal, blue crystal, and tell it of your intents, like where you want to go. And if your judgment got too clouded, it would just stop. So it had, you know, safety in place. And this is, we are going to come to find out that other civilizations have access to this tech later. The next big thing, which was unique to all the other stuff in the books, was that two of the walls were stacked to the brim with small tablets or plaques, which were organized a very small distance apart, I think one centimeter. So there were in total something like tens of thousands of them. And you couldn't get them out by force in any way. You would have to orient them yourself to their exact position, very carefully take them out. And if you tried to replace one with another, it would reject it, so it wouldn't accept it at all because each one represented a certain corner of, of information. And it turns out that, so after a, a lot of trial and error of trying to figure out what they represented, well, one of the guys accidentally on the first strip pressed a button on the side of it, and it came out a hologram, also similar to the other ones, but it was very, very specific. The runtime of these holograms, all of these holograms, is two days around, something like that. And it was also crystal clear, and this one particular one that Pado opened showed a certain galaxy that wasn't recognizable to him. And it showed it in fast motion, but it showed how it went from looking like thriving to a lot of explosions and just tumultuous activity. And it was kind of tragic. He said he, he also felt the empathy of it, although you couldn't, you know, judge it on it. But there are such things as a galactic entity, so probably that was what he felt there. And anyway, they figured out later in the books by book four or something like that, how to extract this information, because uh, this was the main purpose of the trip other than disclosure, is to collect as many of these as they could in these advanced vehicles that were custom made by the Americans to bring back and, you know, extract the data of them. And they got to where they could do it in something like a month, all the information to 80% fidelity, I should say. So not quite perfect, but good enough. And because they could do it simultaneously, these tablets, they could download them. 
yeah, they more or less managed to get all the information by now. The problem is it would take hundreds of scientists their whole lives to explore it all. So, yeah. And by the way, there's no way you're going to make this up just because of so much corroborating data in the book that is unique and so old compared to when we all found out about all these secret things by using the internet. This was pre, I mean, you had internet, but it was much more primitive. So I have no doubt that this is true just because it's so direct and just not once have I been, except I'm going to mention the sixth book. I have a little pet peeve, but it's nothing to do with the credibility. It's just his interpretation. So I'm completely convinced of this. I know it's hard to believe though. So for example, certain ideas that it expressed took me the better part of the book to believe them completely. So I, this is just meant as a quick introduction. Anyway, where was I? Okay, the centerpiece of the room, this is from the movie Time Machine from 2002. This is just to analog it, but it was not too dissimilar. It was a half cylinder that was see-through also on the back of the chair. And it was much more streamlined, not as complex as this. And you would put a band or a strap on the column and one on the forehead. And this is also the exact device that was mysterious to them in the first room. They had it, this was scaled to humans. And the one in the projection room, which is the original one for Ander Bucic, was scaled to the originators of that place, which turns out they were three and a half meters tall, whereas this was like six feet, something like that. And anyway, after he was shown this, also, the author was uh, extremely skeptical, even after seeing all this, that when it was described to him that it was a time machine, but not a time machine like we would perceive it, but one even better, where you would project only your consciousness. And the reason why it's better, you would think it's worse. But also, this demands a lot of, so like with the energy shield, if you can't pass the energy shield, you can forget ever using this. Because it requires a certain lack of mental noise, a certain clarity, purity, or that's how it's described. And also a lot of intent, because you're guided solely by intent in this case. So, of course, he took some convincing by Cesar, who was the guy who took a lot of trips already. I mean, a lot of trips in time. And he quickly went over the main one of them, which is about 10 pages worth, which deals with the real life of Jesus, which there are a lot of misconceptions and a lot of stuff that was covered intentionally, just to name a few. So. It doesn't look like in the iconography. He is not too dissimilar. He was also svelte. He was skinny. He wasn't that tall. He was 1.7 meters, which I think is like 5'5", five, five, maybe more. I'm not sure. And probably all of the people were shorter then. And he did have a beard. He had bigger eyes than he said. He had a bigger forehead, taller. And he really had a huge transformative effect on the people around him, even on the nobility. They would recognize, you know, they would see the source in him. And he would have a lot of sermons, but the vast majority of the contents of the sermons was excluded because complex reasons that go in the book. I'm just going to cover the highlights, which are that he was, and I'm not sure if he was married, but he was certainly a thing with Mary Magdalene. And the reason why it wasn't known, it wasn't let out, is that the apostles were very jealous of this. And they were obviously, you know, sexist. Oh, the, a very interesting part is that he was extremely, extremely psychic. He was just had extreme superhuman ability. So much so that when Cesar projected his consciousness to there, which, uh, by the way, the reason uh, I forgot to mention that this is better than going with your whole body is that you would sense through all five senses and more what was going on in that place and time. So you would get very subtle, you know, emotions, feelings, states that were endemic to that place that you couldn't get otherwise. And you would usually have a, like a bird's eye view. You would see it from above. And when he did that the first time to Jesus, when he sneaked up on Jesus, he immediately recognized him for who he was just because of his aura. Not that he was stood out physically. And Jesus actually recognized him. He turned his head up and communicated telepathically that he's doing a good thing. This, this, this is the reason why Cesar considers the first time, which is this, because this technology takes you to what your heart wants to find out most. Even if you plan ahead, it's pretty much going to take you there. That's just how it works. And this is what he most wanted to elucidate was the life of Jesus. And Jesus recognized him and he communicated to him in a way similar to Makandi, that what he's doing is a good thing. He is on a good mission and he just gave him some confirmation. You know, that's why Cesar treasures this memory very much. 
Okay, now I'm just going to skip to the crucifixion. He, oh, uh, just one more thing. There was an attempt on his life by a blonde person when he was coming down some stairs who looked out of time. And this guy was dressed a little differently, not too differently, but still. And he was hiding something under his uh, like shirt. And when Jesus approached him, he obviously knew ahead of time, felt it. And he told him that you're not doing the right thing and he will be punished, something like that. But, you know, he didn't say it threateningly, he just said he's not doing the right thing by following the orders that is being given. And this is an aside that Peter Moon wrote about Monta Project. And in it, he described a certain blonde person who was sent back in time, I think to kill Jesus and also to extract a vial of his blood. So there's just some corroboration there if you want to look into that more. And next, the crucifixion. When he carried his cross, he wasn't actually helped. Many people attempted to help him carry the cross, but they failed. And they were intercepted by the militia there, and they were even hit by them. And then there was a kerfuffle and a brawl. Then one of the soldiers got hit in the head with a stone, and then all hell broke loose. And then we're just going to go to the crucifixion part. So it did take place. Some people say it didn't. Well, this says it did. This was also shown to Radu in the original hologram. So two sources independent. And the twist here in the story was that there were a lot of extraterrestrials or at least different humanoids attending the crucifixion because they were hiding behind the veils, their faces which were shaped differently. And not just that, but when the moment of death arrived, there was a huge storm that gathered around the hill. And it was so severe that people started panicking and there was like a stampede. And if that wasn't enough, a third of the hill just crumbled and created like a cliff. And then two circular UFOs <laughs> that were highlighted, uh, one by orange and one by light blue, came from behind the crosses and I think emitted some sort of weird noise, yeah, a hum, and just instilled a lot of fear. But the fear was probably not directed to them. I mean, it wasn't, you know, some sort of energy weapon. Also, strange lights appeared that were directed from the UFOs. I don't know. You can draw your own conclusions. So yeah, that was the Jesus. Oh, one last thing about this. Later on, they would receive a lot of corroboration from the Vatican, saying that they too had this type of tech. We know that it's called a chronovisor. The exact teachings that Cesar described, which I didn't go into detail also because I forgot most of them, but they're very interesting, that those are the, the real teachings that he did. And also all the events that they saw, they also saw. Then the last bit about this book is that obviously the author was dying to try this apparatus for himself. And so he mounted the strap on the forehead, but it burned. So he probably had these preconceived notions that he was probably too stressed out, which meant that the first time he managed to be trying to endure the pain, which was a sign that he wasn't ready because other people had this nausea. This is what happened when you didn't have the level of consciousness that was required. But he just had a lot of determination. And finally, he saw Makandi, who basically communicated something to him. But she wasn't quite content with that. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So he went back one more time after like a bit of a rest. And he was just guided to a certain tunnel that Aiden, the whiz guy, saw through his holographic laptop that was almost linked to this room. It came from the main pyramid of the Giza Plateau because this room, sorry that I forgot to mention, is located between the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid. And no one knows exactly why and why it has no connections to anything else, but such is life. And also, this is my own uh, like parallel that I found that Robert Schock, who is famous for his theory on the Sphinx, that it was eroded by rain, that therefore is like 9,000, he keeps changing the dates. But they also had good earth-penetrating technology radar and found out a room that pretty much describes perfectly this room. So the tunnel might have been another dimension, but not the room. I'm pretty sure this is it because it's described exactly perfect. I don't know, maybe I'm extrapolating, but could be. So anyway, so this room that came from the Great Pyramid from a very hidden chamber, so you wouldn't have access to it normally as a tourist, obviously. And it was triangular, so it was like this. and it was described in the middle of the book how they went perfectly towards the occult room, as it's called, the one with all the tech. But after a certain point, 
it just went downwards and it's as if they were mind controlled or something interfered that they completely lost track of where they were going and they kept digging but in a wrong direction and then it just ended and also they found remnants of a different species which was a reptilian skeleton this was what cardinal obadia disclosed and then later regretted that he disclosed it so because he was quite worried and wanted to prove his worth in the group i guess it was still early for him the author radu chiramar this is what the destination of his time travel experience was going back in time to when the tunnel was made through very advanced laser technology was cut through stone and he saw three humanoids with very strange and very ominous features and that's when he kind of you know got scared got spooked and just bowed out oh one last last thing about this was one small paragraph but i found it fascinating that You know how China is so powerful these days with all this space technology that is still kept under wraps. It turns out that they have their own kind of giants. They have their own kind of secret that they completely covered as soon as the smallest peep was heard. And I'm not sure if this is a pyramid. I know they have a few places where they have pyramids, but it was under a pyramid, very well hidden. And they have similar level of technology. And this might just be behind their supremacy right now. I'm at least they're a predicted supremacy that's just you know an observation there okay the fourth book which the first third of this only deals with the department zero the ins and outs of it how it was on very shaky ground for a while around 2010 because they were threatened from all sides from inside and from outside and they found this loophole where they used the author of the book they enlisted him in a remote viewing program in america and because he did exceptionally well there they could elevate him to a certain position i forget the exact details but they just managed to establish a stronger foothold there and not get as much pressure from the higher ups in romanian politics and that's the first third of the book mainly his adventures in america learning remote viewing it is a fun part but you would have to read the other parts first because only then would you be attached to the characters otherwise it's not really that much worth mentioning okay and just because they cover about the middle third of the book i took out the main through lines of the five parchments that was supposedly Radu's mission as told to him by Makandi and i'm just going to read them because they're pretty short so there are five different parchments and they're written in poetry but this is the gist of them the first one is compassion which is there's a divine source of compassion in the universe and we need to recognize and link to it and the second is that we are a result of our thoughts and what you think is what you get and you project your hologram and this is very well known by most people by now I mean, who, who are interested in this it probably made its way first by michael talbot back in 93 through the holographic universe and the third is synchronicity there's no such thing as coincidence and when you think there is you're not, just not able to interpret the real intention although it seems like odds are stacked against you there's a bigger plan in higher you know dimensions which is true i mean and the fourth is vibration that that's i guess the common element in everyone is just i heard even that the whole universe is just a single particle that vibrates at a ridiculously high frequency and the fifth is that you need to align yourself with the highest will and the divine source of creation there kind of seems a little like you know hackneyed but so what's more fun was the discussion that led to them honestly i found them just a touch underwhelming but the discussion to getting there was very nice Okay. The last third of the book is the meat of it really. After the Romanians got out of communism in 89, in the early 90s there was a program to uncover the lost identity of the Dacians and older cultures. And so what they did was they funded these programs, one of them being in Shurianu mountains which is not far from where this picture is which is San Misegetuza which is like the Dacian capital. And this is where things get really interesting also so i told you back in the 90s department 0 also existed and they were called onto the scene a few days into this thing this is how they got went this so there was this professor that was part of this program who was in one of these surrounding villages and he was at this dig with this guy he was staying at and their kid and he took this kid he was just a worker friend and he this kid was depositing his tools 
in a certain circular place. He just wanted to cover it so it wouldn't get rained on. And then he just wanted to test an axe and he accidentally created a crumbling of stone and what unearthed was one and a half meter opening which led to a grotto and he was very happy about it and he went to the professor and they both went in with the lights and it was pretty big nothing spectacular yet and then he saw an opening like a small slit and he had the kid dig through it and so he did and then he, they went further on because it, it led to an even bigger cavern. And they went on about uh, half a kilometer until another opening, but a circular one, through which they could hear a very strange and perturbing hum. But because it was such a novel thing, they persisted and they went through. And then they saw the real anomalies because the ground was completely flat. All of this was sloped, so they were still going down, uh, declined. But they went on and they even saw perfectly level stairs. And by the end of this section, they came to a bifurcation, one of which was smaller than the other one. So they went to the bigger one because it was better lit. So what they noticed by this time, he could approach and he could clearly see because before he saw what he interpreted as basalt. But in this smaller room, which is not small at all, it took him 150 meters to the end and it was wide, something like 20 meters, and very tall as well. And not just the walls, but the ceiling and the floor was all gold. So pretty much something that you never hear about. You usually have to, you know, extract the ore. And this was all gold, and a huge vein of gold at the end that was protruding, that was incredibly thick. But all of this was untouched, untouched by anything, any tool. And there was no mistaking that it was gold. He even took photographs. He, and not just that, there was a huge golden bed that has an inscription near to it. And this inscription, very carefully done. So he took pictures of the inscriptions. There were more than that one. There were also six thrones, so three on each side, around a golden table. So this was all gold. They were very simplistically shaped, the thrones, and quite sharp edges. And at the end of the table, the seventh throne was much bigger than the other ones. And behind each of the thrones on the walls was an inscription. And he took photographs as best as he could. At the time, he didn't have a very good camera. But at least he had the evidence. And each of the inscriptions was personalized to the chair. Oh, and at the end of the room, behind the biggest chair of all, was this huge portal. Even before reaching that point, he could see like an ethereal light covering the whole room. I think it was light blue. And he approached it, and when he saw the, uh, yeah, he just got shivers because it was, he could see like a cosmos and a planet that would look something like what the Earth looks like from the moon, except it was different color. It was orange and blue and yellow, as far as I remember. And the rest was just starry. When they approached it, the two of them, there came a vortex out of that, similar to like, what we hear about describe when people go through jump gates and it emerged slowly, I mean quickly, but in a matter of a few seconds there to where they were, it linked to them. And then he created like this, you know, slide. And the young guy just up and jumped in and was never seen again. And as a sign that he didn't just kill himself, the vortex slowly went back exactly the same on top. And obviously the professor didn't do that. <laughs> And he went back and he alerted some security. I think he went straight to Bucharest and three SRI guys came quickly to the western of the country, which is also, this is an hour away from me. So they came back quickly. They came to Shodano Mountains and they were very stricken by what they were seeing. I think there were four at first and one of them jumped in, like the young guy. So anyway, there were three outside of the professor. And because they panicked and they knew the importance of this, not just because of the inscriptions, the portals, but mainly the gold, obviously. As it was described, it was possibly more than all the other mines on Earth. I take some exception to this just because of how it was described that is lurking under the Vatican, you know, something like a 20-digit number. So this three quickly covered, took a mixer to this site, cement mixer, and covered it up. And not just with that, but then they put earth and plants on it. So no one would judge to look in. And they went back to Bucharest. 
but on their way back, they died in a car wreck. Luckily, the professor wasn't in the car, although he was taken by police the very next early next day and no one heard from him again, except Cesar, who is the second main character in the books, who was working at Department Zero and got to talk to him the night before. So anyway, the reason why it's probably not a premeditated assault on the guys who were in the wreck is that it was all too sudden and there was not enough time. And also because they left the dossier that contained all the photographs and the information that was described by the professor. If it would have been intentional, then probably would have been, you know, picked up. Okay. Cesar analyzed the pictures, which he did have access to later, and they sent them to different research centers in the world. And it came back that this was the original Indo-European language from which all the other ones that we know later branched off to, or offshoots of. And it's explained in quite a lot of detail. It basically contains, this language contains all the radicals, which is the small parts of words that have a certain meaning. Certainly, all the European languages seem to have their origin here. And so one of the inscriptions said about how Kronos lives here, how, you know, God of time. Just as a small corroboration that this is not made up, it's well documented that when Romans conquered Dacians 2,000 years ago, they went back to Rome with 200 tons of gold, 300 tons of silver, they declared four months of a continual celebration. They had tax exemptions for an entire year. Some say that they were so spoiled that this was what led to their decline, but I think that's a reach. Just a bit of evidence that Romania is so replete with gold, not just outside of this cave, because Apusen, for example, is the biggest source there. Okay, that pretty much ties up the fourth book. And now we're getting to the really heavy stuff. So it's called Inside the Earth, the Second Tunnel, and it could as well be titled uh, Hollow Earth because that's the theory it postulates. So not just honeycomb caverns inside the Earth. So the conventional science, which is very outdated, says that there's a crust, thin crust, then the mantle for like 2,000 kilometers, then an outer and inner core, and they extrapolated this from the magnetic field the way it unfolds, and then they had experiments, Cavendish lead balls, they're called. They're hundreds of years old, and they're still using them, and thinking only physically, and not even taking into account the Earth's electricity, that it varies. They basically think it has no charge at all. Not just that, but they're using Newton's law of gravity, which is hundreds of years old, which they think that it's universal. Also, it completely fails to explain all their studies. Their deepest one, which is Kola in Russia, K-O-L-A, they dug to 12 kilometers. That's the best they could. What's that, like eight miles, seven miles? And their findings went completely against their predictions that they would find basalt. They based the predictions on seismic waves, which is the only thing that you can even really rely on to give you data, because anything else, like these wild speculations about the inside of the Earth, are so ridiculous. You could never, ever, using our technology, go any deeper than, maybe a little deeper than this, so it was predicted that basalt would be found at five kilometers, but they found it when they stopped. They can't predict even the weather, let alone volcano activity. This is why they can't do it. They also can't predict earthquakes at all. They're completely oblivious to these things. Also, the way the mountains are formed, they only say because the tectonic plates are moving one into another or away from each other. But what they fail to see, and the reason why you can't go any deeper with our 3D basic technology, is what's happening is that the deeper down you go, you enter more and more into the frequencies of 4D or the etheric plane. You're not in there if you're just, say, halfway through the mantle, which is real. The mantle is the only last thing they got right. So even if like the author wonders and asks the Lama, who is still with him at this time, what would happen if he just was taken in like this cylinder and he would just go inside and it was see-through, and what would he see? And the thing is, he wouldn't see because he wouldn't be ready to see. And hear me out. So uh, it took me like 80 pages to believe it. He could only see. So there have been people who have gone very, very deep. But as he was, when he was asking a question, just by virtue of asking a question, the naivety of it, you couldn't get there just because you wouldn't be, you know, elevated or sophisticated enough to withstand that type of depth. So 
if you were to section it, what you would find actually inside the Earth, other than the many caverns that we all know are populated by humans and humanoid species alike. So the inside of the Earth is actually hollow. And it's a size that would be best approximated as the size of Venus. And it doesn't stop actually at the etheric level. So it becomes fully etheric when you pass the mantle. Past that, you're not going to find any more caverns, which also add up a lot. They have a lot of population there. Anyway, so the closer you go to this very center, the closer you get to what's called a singularity, which is described in this book as the, the causal plane. And yeah, you progress to there. So the first one is the physical, obviously. The third, I should say, the third dimension. Then we get etheric, which is 4D. And also 4D is the land of the immediate land of the dead and the land of the sleeping. Then you get astral, then you get mental, and then you get causal. And then he makes a um, correlation with the way that we saw how as above, so below, pretty much applies to everything. So how electrons spin around the nucleus. Mm -hmm. These things don't go to it, so they're mimicked in the entire universe. The same way that so-called black holes are actually not black holes, it's a misnomer, because it's the source of 99% of the, the matter in any given galaxy, the core of it. A better name would be um, Mother Star. So the way it attracts and emanates matter, by the way, water also is multidimensional. And this shouldn't be surprising anyone, because it comes from the higher planes, into this physical as ice. And that's basically the platform on which you get the stars and planets. This water that materializes in 3D then collects dust, uh, cosmic dust and matter, and then just clumps, but then it's attracted back to the center. And then it forms a lid around the core and that forms the personality and identity of the planet. At least that's how it's described more or less. And then it just goes off in its own direction. and the idea that our planets are just willy-nilly, you know, scattered around and whatever life is on them is just a factor, a product of their position in the universe. That's also something that needs revision because it turns out that they all have their own soul, which is also in the center of it. He later got showed, I might as well go for it in time a little bit, in another hologram, he was shown the actual real section of the Earth although you can section it with any of today's apparatus. And he actually got a glimpse into the spirit of the planet. And he saw that even though, sure enough, Gaia, the soul, is feminine, and you can see that reflected in various ways in, on Earth, but the actual spirit which resides in the point of singularity, the core of the planet, is actually masculine. But that's not really important. What's important, because he thought how it was very dynamic and powerful, I guess. But what you need to memorize from this is that the same way that matter arises from the center of the galaxy, the contents of the Earth, and every single part of it is a result of the intent of the planet itself that comes from the center. So basically, it creates a vortex around the core, and it chooses what it wants to implement there, which is usually, you know, it has an ocean inside that's even well known, and lava and rock and gas and crystals, and those are the ingredients. Oh yeah, the way you access inner earth, obviously the way you access them today, because it used to be different, is through two means. Either portals that are very well guarded because there are not many of them left. One of these portals was what hid behind the metal tunnel of the projection room. But it's not the only one in the world. There are even portals that take you from place to place on the surface of the planet as there are portals that take you from here to caverns inside, deep caverns, or from here to hollow earth. But you could never ever picture hollow earth with today's, you know, way of thinking because it's just in a non-physical dimension. So you would have to just, I guess, feel it or witness it. That's why it's, these things are so impossible because they take experience. But anyway, so the other way you could enter hollow earth is the way Admiral Byrd did it, at least so we are told, that the place where the gravitational line and the magnetic line align, they match up, is North and South Pole. And if you are of the right frame of mind, and if you are, you know, refined enough, or if you are actually wanted there, 
then you can get access to it. The way you're going to find out is not, not like in Pirates of the Caribbean where their ship turned upside down or anything like that. And it's not through a tunnel. It's through what's called the Mobius effect or like a plane that kind of twists like that. Very subtly is how we're going to go. It's going to be at the pole, so it's going to be very cold. And you're going to be able to tell that you're in hollow earth by the fact that all of a sudden you're going to see palm trees and other vegetation that would be out of place and also creatures. And yeah, I'm not going to go into Admiral Birds because it's too much. It's too overwrought, that story. All righty, round two with Daniel Sala. We will pick up where we left off. Daniel, the floor is yours. Sure. So I left off this Transylvania series by Radu Cinamar, and it ended kind of abruptly because we went too long, but I left it after the explanation of hollow earth theory. And now it gets into the actual inner earth part of things on an experience basis. It starts off with more explanation about how it works down there. So obviously you're not going to have the same atmosphere and the same elements. The way you're sustained over there is more through subtle means. I mean, it compensates. You're not going to need the same. It does have all the essentials of upstairs, but in a lesser amount. So it has to make up for it by being closer to the etheric plane. And that kind of feeds you. It doesn't go into huge detail. But for example, the point of singularity that we established, so it's 700 kilometers in diameter. It's at the very center of the Earth. And you wouldn't be able to see it right now because, you know, you wouldn't be able to perceive because it's non-physical. And the way you perceive it, once you get to the etheric plane, which I think the barrier is after 2,300 kilometers, if you're going straight down, the way you're going to interpret it is like a sun, actually. It's like a fainter version of a sun and kind of white instead of uh, yellow. And the caverns that happen also are not a result of anything but the Earth's natural meridians. So like we have our own flux energy lines in our bodies. The same goes for the earth and that accounts for all the natural events like mountains formation and volcanoes and earthquakes. And it turns out that when our surface terrain is deeper, so like in oceans, that for them translates as taller mountains. All right. And the first trip, so Cesar and Radu are pretty much together throughout the whole book. And Radu has to go through some upgrades of sorts because unlike Cesar, he hadn't had the privilege of going to so many inner earth trips. So he couldn't just go straight to hollow earth, although he would eventually. So we had to start also because there's so much going on, at least under Romania, that is explained in the book. So he went through the second tunnel in the projection hall. And inside it, unlike the other places, which had pretty much straight tunnels, this one started with a bifurcation that led to actual hollow earth and one that led to inner earth, which is the caverns and the grottos that are way inside earth. And before he went inside, he actually had to communicate that he was going there to the destination, which was, might as well say it, so it was an ancient city where Dacians retreated thousands of years ago. So there are such things as pure blood Dacians. So this representative who was kind of an elder, he also looked specific, like blonde, and he looked in his 50s, bearded, and in like a robe of a monk that was gray. So they entered the portal that led them to inner earth, actually led them to a half circle room that was huge and it was sort of like a station of sorts. And they were greeted by this guy and he was telepathic, but he chose to speak in Romanian, but you would also hear more refined telepathic imprints while he was talking to him. And I'll speak more about what their actual language sounds like later. And they eventually entered a lift, Cesar, Radu and Drin. And through this lift, which is see-through, probably like the transparent metal that we hear in the SSPs that exists on Earth but has been, you know, obscured. Through this lift, which he traveled with very, very quickly downwards, he could see all the layers of the Earth, but he wasn't affected except very, very slightly. And he could see the rocks, the various rocks and the crystals and the lava. And when he was going through the lava parts, he, he would feel some heating up, but not unpleasant. And this is, uh, he's not an artist, the uh, author of this book, but this is best rendition, I guess, of the town that they first visited in Inner Earth. It was called Tomasis, and it was situated, as you can see here, underneath the main port city that is linked to the Black Sea in Romania. And also, it used to be an outpost of Dacians called Tomis, so that's why the link is there. And this kind of shows their trajectory. So inside, he could see 
a sea in the distance. But before that, he could see some low-lying vegetation and some Greek-style houses, so kind of square, straight edges, no more than two floors. And it was lit by a kind of ceiling that was about 200 meters off, I think. And it had reddish, yellowish tints. And there was some fog as well, and it was moving. But all there was was lava that was separated by a few meters, or I think, of rock that still kept the luminosity. And that's how they managed to, you know, do their day-to-day. But it is not the only way you can light up an inner earth cavern. This is just one of them. So I told you, the architecture was pretty much like classical Greece. Their language was, when they heard them actually eventually talk to each other, was a mix between Old Greek and Latin, which is congruent to our last episode. And actually, when they got there, they got on a platform that was above the city which also had about 200,000 people. And they were met with the anti-grav platforms that were a little more rounded than in the occult room, which they just, you know, mounted. And it took them automatically to the sea end of the town. And Cesar then went with other Dacians there because they were pure blood. Because what they did was they basically absconded the Roman when they got overthrown by them back 2,500 years or so. And Cesar went with some Dacians, whom he had more contact with previously, to elaborate on some sharing of technology, because they actually, so this looks slightly more primitive, but it's not at all. This is just how they choose to have it, because inside you could see, so it was peaceful atmosphere, but he could see vehicles and just all sorts of technology that was way ahead of us. And also, when he noticed the Dacians that Cesar would go off with, he noticed that they had some implants on the side of the head that I think were triangle shaped that jutted out a little bit and it made their communication easier. And he was met by this 30 year old looking Dacian woman, but she told him she was actually 45, so they aged slower. And she told him this and that about their culture there, that the vast majority of them actually have to be birthed up on the surface because of different celestial influences that you would be deprived of down there. And there are very rare exceptions, like Drin was actually one of them. And she actually was part of some experience exchange program where she would spend every certain cycle of a few years, she would spend a period of time up on the surface, just an exchange of information. Also, she wanted to see for herself. Then it goes a little bit into history. So even this particular town, obviously was limited by the size of the cavern, but they wouldn't have wanted to expand anyway. It's perfect for them. They lived there for thousands of years and they were perfectly well off. And even that one they inherited, first of all, it was an ancient ET civilization. And after they kind of outgrew it, another more human civilization settled in and then they related to the Dacians. And at the beginning, before they got conquered by the Romans, only the elders and monks would be able to have access there. And that was limited and they would go through portals because obviously, I forgot to mention this one was very, very down low. So it was almost to the etheric plane, but it wasn't, but it was so close that you would very much feel the effects. So it felt totally different. And they would have a totally different hierarchy. They would actually follow their most experienced and most steady and most spiritual and usually older people. They would put them in charge. And this we're going to see is, is the case with ETs as well. Only we don't go for that. So they also are more and more involved in sharing the advanced tech that they had. Like he was shown a spaceship that, I mean, not a spaceship, kind of a capsule ship that would go through walls, possibly capable of space flight, I'm not sure, that would tap into the gravity field and it would convert it to magnetic field. I forget the exact details. It was about a page of the book. But it would basically create a fold in time space and they would be able to go through the walls that would connect these cities underground. And so it would very much ease. They wouldn't have to create holes like for malls or tunnels of any sort like we do, like with the dumps. Next up, using one of these ships and with this lady that got acquainted with, he visited the other main town underground. This time it was under Apusain Mountains. And it was much wider and more populous, but it was much shallower, I mean, less tall. It was only 70 meters tall or so, and it had very different architecture. The material was like a crystal that was kind of see-through, and it would shimmer beautifully and reflect all kinds of lights. And instead of lava lighting it, it would be like a diffuse light that was engineered 
it would go into details how it would have layers upon layer of noble metal, like a souped up lid would be the equivalent, and also quartz crystals, which would be at the bottom, and they would use two types of gravity, so they wouldn't need any other source of energy. It would, first of all, use the gravity that is normal Earth gravity, and the gravity that came from actually the layers of rock overhead. So the vegetation here was considerably taller. There were even streams. And they explained to him how they carry equipment and other provisions from the surface to down there, which was through a type of teleportation, which also applied for humans. And later he would go through this and he would only feel like a slight bit of nausea, but it would be fine. And when he got into Optelos, which was also on a platform up over the city, he was just more of a diplomatic mission, at least on the end of Radu. He was shown holographic technology, I mean, like a hologram that came out of a slit, that would work very similar to the projection room one. Also, they mentioned to him that unlike the pure Dacians from Tomasis, in Apelos, they were actually hybridized. So they would look pretty much human. They would all have your hair and lighter skin, very white. And they would have slightly almondy eyes and slightly bigger, but pretty much would pass for humans. And the reason they would look different is they were hybridized, and I might as well say because it is only revealed in Book 7, they were hybridized with the Pleiadians, certain part, because the Pleiadians cover a lot of different peoples. So he was curious. It was an intuitive type of attack that covered also their history, just a little bit. He only had a limited time. And he showed him the first settlers there. So the first, you had like cavemen level that went down there through the normal means, which was the squiggly type of tunnels that would lead there normally that were very arduous to traverse. And then cut to a few thousand years later, you got slightly better technology level people, but not enough to be alone there by themselves because they wouldn't be able even to light up the place properly. So I think the next vision was they were accompanied also kind of older time people by actual aliens in very tight fitting blue suits and they were blonde and they were taller and they were helped through the process of accommodating with the place and that might have been the Pleiadians, I'm not sure. It doesn't say. Also, as I said, they do some trading because they can't grow everything down there, but they are so ahead of us in terms of everything scientific and technology and more because they're also much closer to 40, but they're actually only 70 kilometers underground, but because they're hybridized, they are much more refined. Okay, and the last third of the book really just deals with hollow earth missions. The first two of which I'm just going to gloss over quickly because they are also just diplomatic in nature. The first one was through the projection hall, also a portal. He noticed it was very different down in the etheric dimension. It was on just an island because of some stuff that happened before a long history that made it so he had to be isolated at the beginning again. They were met by this guardian who approached very, very slowly, and he was like three and a half meters tall, and he was dark and kind of ambiguous from the book description. And he spoke only telepathically, and he only rode them with an old boat to the edges of Shambhala, but not really very near, because he stated that he really wanted to get there, but he clearly wasn't ready at the time, which I'll clarify why later. Shambhala is not really a city, but an accumulation of places that have been around since 120,000 years ago. That's when the Shambhala started. Slowly and slowly, which I'll go into in the sixth book, it got separated, and now it's only there. And now it represents kind of the capital of the hollow earth. But until that point, so this was just kind of to up his frequency of vibration or whatever. That's how it said. So it would be ready for more and more trips down there because this was a process and your DNA would have to acclimatize itself to it gradually and anyway next trip was very interesting the way they got there so you get these americans that they collaborated with they were kind of the darker side of pentagon but not the darkest the darkest will be covered in book seven so anyway they got invited cesar and radu because of their experience with this with trips they got invited to america to yosemite california where you had native americans who it's well known that they have this type of portal tag they could project themselves inside hollow earth the problem was the Americans couldn't reach it and they couldn't reach an agreement with them because as it was explained to them that you would have to have a certain level of consciousness to even be able to enter the conversation of going there. So it was pointless to even argue with them. So that's why they invited them. They quickly got there and they witnessed a ritual which would invoke this portal, which used a very old, very worn out dagger. 
that was put on the ground by a shaman. And then of a spiritual young lady that had very prominent features, like a Native American. Clearly, all these guys are pure Native Americans. And she set out some tonal noises in a particular order. So out came this portal that behind it was just distortions. And before that, she had checked both Cesar and Radu. And Cesar had easily passed the test. She was a little iffy about Radu, but she said he was fine too. And so they went one by one. First, she took Cesar and then Radu. They had to go together so they would be touching her. And they just found themselves in another etheric hollow earth place that was not Shambhala. It was something that was carved in a mountain, a huge hall. And it had strange writing symbols that are explained in the book. And it had very lush vegetation all the way to the horizon. And it had some houses here and there. He could even see some pterodactyls. So there's some truth to the Jules Verne novel, I guess. But anyway, they got acquainted with this also very telepathic taller figure who just exchanged niceties. This exchange was not very fruitful. So I'm just going to cut to the last interesting one, which was this guy that I told you was kind of boring in terms of story. He told them to meet the final place inside Hollow World that would entrain him to finally be able to do these trips on the regular. It was in Patagonia. They had to fly there and go through another portal and meet a man in, in total wilderness. There was nothing but desert around. And so they did. They went there and they were met with this very silent type who just led them to this cave. And outside of the cave came a couple of men and women who turns out were inhabitants of the Hollow Earth city, which was called Utklaha. And they were actually old Native Americans, old timey, that were not so on the surface for a long, long time. And when they reached inside the cave, they kept going forward as if the cave would never end, although it did clearly in front of them. But the walls around them would morph into different selectites and what have you, like formations that are usually distributed to the magma. And eventually they got straight inside their house. So inside the house, the first impression he got when he was in the etheric plane was that when he would look at something like a chair, and he didn't like a certain aspect, he would look much, much closer and suddenly it would change shape to what he wanted, but in a very subtle and you couldn't manifest anything you wanted, but you get the idea. So this kind of dovetails into the way they actually have and write books because he was curious about an aspect of their house, which otherwise kind of looked similar in terms of, you know, purpose that our houses do. He was interested in this area of the house that clearly was kind of a shelf of books. And when he went closer, he could see that he he couldn't really perceive the books. So the lady of the house did some sort of gesture with her hand and off came a film that would cover the books. So he took one in his hand and he described that as feeling as a disc holder case because of the thickness of the pages. So he would turn the pages and each page would contain like, uh, for example, a hundred years of history. But the way he would receive this information was totally different and more intuitive than anything he had ever seen, including the first books, because he could take the approach of just general information or zero in on very specific things. But it would be both telepathic. His information would be fed to him, both telepathic, but also he would see images at the same time. And there would be symbols throughout the pages that he could press with his finger. And they would also get more in detail if you wanted to get more information on certain things. And it was only led to the dexterity of the reader. So that's the only limit. And he said that it would totally revolutionize the way we educate people. And he could find out so much about the history. So he even probed a little bit and saw that these particular guys in Utklaha, their ancestors were the Olmecs and Toltecs. And they got there at the beginning. It was just a village that was kind of scattered. But now it was a full-blown city. And it was also very near to Shambhala. So you could see Shambhala from it. And it would look like also old timey buildings, but it was very clean. And, you know, if they had take like, for example, looking out of the house, you would see nothing but the outside. But when you get out, you would turn your back and you would see a door and you could peer ahead forward and back. No problem. You just go into it. And he also felt a slight difference in temperature. So the explanation was, it was kind of just to conserve a little bit of temperature. And the same goes for windows. So as I said, he could see Shambhala from there, but he could only see the first layer of it because it's kind of circular, like think of the town in Middle Earth. And he could only see the first part of it because the deeper you went, the more refined you would have to be. And that's where the really advanced races, uh, I'm not just going to leave it ambiguous like that. We're going to come back to this in the sixth book. So he could also see ships that would go both vertically and horizontally. 
and they were all shapes and sizes. And some of them even came down through a sort of tornado, which apparently was the way it looked when you would come through, through the poles. So we have to move on because this book is very big and it deserves the title of Genesis. It really is what it says. It just deals with the real history of humanity, but it didn't just rely on the projectional technology. What it did was he established more of a relationship with the Apelos people who we established are the hybridized race. And he got a gift that totally blew his mind, which are these kind of goggles or headset. And through them, so it would enhance him in two ways. There would be the etheric mode, which is on the right. You would press this appendix and you would see basically in 4D with very huge, you know, 4D overtones. And the other mode was kind of a replay. You would press it and you would automatically like record everything, but in perfect quality. And of course, all you would have to do when you wanted to tap in on a certain part of your life was to think of it and you would automatically be back in time, but you would still have the awareness that you are where you are. And this was the form of the room that he was taken in a deposit that was overground, but it was by these two Apelos people. And the express mission of this was to show him, probably because they knew he was an author and he would let this out because that's all these guys, the Apelos guys, I mean, not all, but it's a huge part of their mission is to actually help us in more ways than this, also medicine wise, that's going to be covered later. So he got taken to this room and they sat on this couch and out came like, you know, these modern TVs, which are foldable, but instead of a TV, a hologram came out, a very large one. And using this etheric mode of the goggles, he would have so, so much information and the hologram would tap into the Akashic records. It would be only limited by pretty much the user and it has certain features. You would have to think of the study that you would have there, and that would be the only link. You would just want to think of your topic and the ramifications therein. Also, if you lost your train of thought, it would actually blur out, so you'd have to be on your game. And that's why he even struggled at first. But uh, whenever he did struggle, uh, he was helped on by the Apelos guy who was on his left, and he would either reconfigure it for himself, because if he blurred out too much and he was freeze, then you would have to start from the beginning. That's just how it worked. And you can imagine that actually makes you so much more focused and so much more open to this type of information. This holographic tech uses Akashic records. So you can pretty much, it's a safe bet that if it's described in detail like this, I mean, you know, you can't put your life on the line, but you're not going to find more trustworthy sources in this. Okay, so that's the exposition. And now we're just going to cover the rest of this book. The real history of humanity as he was shown it because that was a topic that he wanted to see and he took kind of two classes you could say there were nine hours long for two consecutive days so the first vision was that there were more and more advanced but still primitive primates on earth scattered but the most advanced which were very near to homo erectus so that's what it says it doesn't say that it was specifically them might have been and they were actually in the sinai peninsula the most you know smart and curious and that exhibited the most you know human qualities and they were the ones that went through this whole transformation process because neither the obviously creationism or the theory of evolution or even the tablets that were left behind that were documented by zacharias sitchin and the like none of them really have it right but obviously the latter is the closest by far so what was significant the first also he could date this he could date it by overlaying some frequencies there and he got used to their symbology which was specifically just to the apollos people but there are also a lot of symbology that it turns out is universal that he later understood more and more as he got used to it so what he was shown that was most significant at first was kind of a celestial alignment celestial bodies including stars planets but also others which turns out astrology is very real. And it showed him six such bodies in the center of which was Earth. So Earth was very privileged in this particular time. It was exactly 432,000 years ago, by the way, that this first change took place. And the Homo erectus got zoomed in and into their DNAs and it showed how the molecules of carbon, which link the nitrogen and oxygen in the DNA, all of a sudden, because of the alignment of the stars and the gravitational and other levels of existence effects, had 
on the structure of the DNA. It created more and more covalences or ability to create bonds. And it goes into a lot of depths for a few pages. And he could also, at any level, he could see these folders and he could go deep on any of these. He could see that not just the carbon, but pretty much all the atoms and the DNA underwent a huge upgrade where they had more and more options, basically. And not just in this plane, but the quantum plane as well. And you can see here, this is a straight influence on the electrons movement. And this is the influence that is etheric, which was from the stars. And it's not just haphazardly put there because it goes into like the letter and the symbols and everything. And it has actual names for each of them. But this would take too long to cover that. So got to about, so the influence that these stars had on the bodies of these primates that were more advanced than anything else on the planet at the time, it took 10,000 years to bloom fully, but continued to have a large effect after that. Also, Earth in general, the reason for its wealth of life, the variety and stability, is that we're not in a particularly endangered part of the galaxy, meaning we don't have huge clusters of stars or something that, that come near us every once in a while. We're more or less protected by that type of more brusque events that would otherwise cost us. So anyway, I'm just going to say it. So you heard of Nibiru. What Nibiru actually was, you can't fault anyone for thinking it's a planet. It's actually called Neberau, and it was actually a giant mothership. And it housed Sirius A well, Syrians, but also you could call them Anunnaki. And there was a huge interplanetary war 370-something thousand years ago, so about 60,000 years after the initial change in what would later become humans. And after this war, this giant ship that was almost the size of the moon approached Earth, and it was quite heavily damaged from this war. And they needed more materials, among which was gold, but it wasn't limited to gold. Oh, just one thing I got reminded of. So it seems kind of suspect that people know that Nibiru is this planet and now all of a sudden they find out it's a ship. But he got very distracted at the beginning, especially Radu, when seeing these visuals. And whenever he did, the image would blur out or freeze and he would be, you know, guided back with the help of the Apelos guy. But when he made the correlation of Neiberau and Nibiru, that it's actually what we interpret as a planet, there was no such lag or anything, it went on. So that pretty much confirms that he was right about that. The Syrians looked, you know, not very unlike what is in Prometheus, very light skinned, but some of them did have hair and it would be kind of like the tall white description of hair, which was shimmering and white or gray or silver, I mean. Also, the difference between what we usually interpret as the Anunnaki is that their heads were slightly elongated towards the back. And yeah, they certainly wouldn't pass for humans, but clearly humanoids. So their initial purpose when they approached Earth was to mine it. And they did. And they would actually levitate these elongated cubes, I guess, and they would settle on the ground. So they would have to get off the ship for this, which would later turn out to be a problem because they had trouble breathing our atmosphere. And this kind of goes hand in hand with what I heard other people say. And I heard the element that they couldn't stand was nitrogen. Anyways, it's not in the book. So they would have to get out of the ship and levitate these objects. And out of them came kind of this filaments that would go inside the earth. And it would just suck out the gold and other metals that they needed. Until Tenecao, who you can consider the father of humanity in a way, he was very, very oriented towards the spiritual end of things and very noble and had all the more refined characteristics that you would expect. So one time they got approached by these Homo erectus kind of relatives and they got more and more curious and bold. And at one point, Tenekau entered the meditation and just tilted his head like this. And that's when he came up with his genius idea that he would spend the rest of his life trying to get to fruition. And when he found that they weren't quite as primitive as he thought, they used them actually to mine. First of all, they would just telepathically guide them to do kind of their bidding through all these means. But afterwards, he would make a conscious effort to level them up to enhance them by putting this 
he put himself into this kind of sphere that had a chair in it, and there were soon out a lot of cylinders that would act as kind of emitters. So he could do it on multiple primates at once that he could telepathically guide them. And that in time made them more malleable. So this goes on. And when they got to a somewhat usable configuration, their DNA, they also went into their very advanced holographic tech and figured out that they can even further use the celestial influences, even kind of artificially, by actually whenever there was a star missing in this constellation that would have affected Earth, they would place themselves, and it would have to be at the perfect distance from Earth and perfect rotation and everything, and then they would beam, like, substitute the planet or star. And this went on and on, and I just forgot to mention that when he told to the elders, he went to the elders of the ship to present this kind of theory of his and this project, it turns out that they didn't just accept it, but told him that this was his purpose, he was his mission, and not just their mission, but the whole ship's mission. And this came from higher planes, and this was an inevitable unfolding of things. And so that pretty much made him happy. And they actually completely put all the efforts, reoriented the ship completely so it would only serve this end until the end of its lifetime. And the initial influences that took Homo erectus relatives out of their kind of stupor was represented by E, the letter E. And then this further enhancement was represented by N. So all these much smarter primates, you could say, are part of the N branch. And this is relevant now because before too long, they would separate into two main groups. A little further up from Sinai, now they're in the Arabian Peninsula. So you had the ENKs more to the north and the ENLs more on the coasts. And the ENLs were the ones that were much more spiritually inclined. They would have a much bigger biofield around them that would be visible and they would be much more interchangeable between etheric and physical planes, whereas the ENKs or ENKs, they were actually more physically robust, but they were shorter and they wouldn't have access to pretty much at all the etheric plane and they were much more rudimentary in every way. The ENLs got the attention of all these ET species, not just the Syrians. And yeah, that's what they used for a long, long time. So the ENKs were completely led to their own devices for hundreds of thousands of years. But they will come back into the mix in a very big way later, you're going to see. So anyway, they got more and more diversified, even to the point where ENLs got to live aquatically. And I heard the Pleiadians actually took them away. And yeah, they underwent more and more upgrades on board their ships. It wouldn't just be enough that what was the primates would all of a sudden, just using these kind of subtle influences, would turn upright all the way and would lose the velocity or hair of the apes. And they had more and more upgrades done on them on board the ship and hybridizations until the point where Tenekau himself was it's able... upgrades, right? This is the genome being played with, right? This isn't... Exactly. Like... Okay, yeah, yeah, just trying to further refine. Yeah, DNA, DNA splicing with ET races. Splicing well, also, too, what about unlocking or activating what people call junk DNA? You get No, them... because that comes later. The junk DNA is, is specific to ENKs. Okay. And it turns out we are ENKs. Okay, I'm sorry to get ahead of it. Go ahead, go ahead. No, it's fine. And so it got to the point finally, and they were very happy about this, that they got so advanced that Tenekau himself could project his consciousness. He, you, we know about transfer, not project, but just move his whole consciousness inside one of these hybrids, which he did. And that way he could better influence and better, you know, hurry up the process of getting these guys where they should be and where he initially saw that their potential could lead them to. And that was the rebodying. And the other milestone was just the instant that they sensed that there was a fetus that was advanced enough that could, without hybridization, just be fully human. They instantly took him out and grew him in like an alveola, a little tank, just so they would nurture him better. And he was Adam. That was Adam, and that was his name back then as well, so that still stands. The catch is he was not male. He was actually androgynous. 
And he was the first one that he could say was human, but also so, so much more because he was on the level of ETs. He was the first one that could totally, you know, go toe to toe with the ETs. So don't imagine that Adam was this kind of backwards fellow because we would do well to have like a quarter of his psychic powers. But it went on and on the trend of androgynous beings that were very, very meditative and kind of had the same qualities of the Syrians. And this went on until they formed a few thousands, but it was obviously not enough. So using the influence of the moon, they use it, I forget exactly how, I don't know if it's even said, maybe it's just a throwaway statement, but using the moon, the sexes came about, first of all, the female, but there was no such thing as Eve, according to this. But you could still say that Adam is the father of humanity as well, because he wouldn't be entitled. He did so much to influence the world around him just through osmosis or whatever, which is a huge deal. I mean, we're being deprived of that, of any ET, but we would also be so much better off if we had open communication with them. But there's a very good reason that you will know by the end why that's not the case. So anyway, at this time, so the ENLs were very targeted, I mean, were very wanted by all sorts of upwards of 20 ET species, which all hybridized with them, either because they wanted to prolong their own species or just to add complexity. And what you would get when you crossed, because you did have crossings of ENKs and ENLs, and what you would get is a demigod. Those are demigods. Anyway, on Earth, after that, it took place a huge compartmentalization where you had very huge differences in advanced peoples where you could have like spear wielding and uh, axe in one settlement and right next to it you could have anti-gravity and hybridizations and whatnot and they were also left like this intentionally because of treaties that would not allow more than your certain territory that was purposefully done to allow all of them to specialize in their own way because this would eventually lead to a greater fortitude just to the fact that you left it to their own you know free will. And that's why it was important that the angst were left alone at the beginning. They were very steadily gained ground. And it turns out that a lot of humans are very highly used, I mean, are very highly involved in the formation of entirely new species because of the time that the ENL creatures were taken and used for their DNA. So that's also maybe why we find so many humans or very close to humans in the experiencer's account. And then it jumps to a huge ET war that took place for 100,000 years ago, because at the time you had the ETs actually on Earth, not just these guys, ENL and ENKs. And this war was very costly on many levels because it had very advanced tech, which would, you know, raise everything to the ground, basically. But it wasn't actually even quite as costly and as nasty as the TARS war. I mean, that's how he heard it, T-A-R, but it might be Tarzan in English. So these TARS, they mainly consisted of ENLs, and they would occupy what today is the center third of Europe, which went from Scandinavia down to Greece. At the time, actually, Scandinavia wouldn't even be separated by water, and the Mediterranean was much smaller. And the war that they had came about because at the time there were a lot of portals to what we now know as Shambhala, which is for the or Hollow Earth. And they wanted to have a domain over these territories. And also they had a lot of belief systems at the time. This was another reason. And so they formed all these alliances and eventually it focused in on a certain area that was very rich in portals. And it got so chaotic that almost no one even knew who they were fighting for. So anyway, it was very nasty, very costly war that was even worse than the ET war because of the ferocity involved. And you had even demigods fighting. You had just sword fighting or ENKs. You had even ENL, a few, but you had some ENL creatures which were at the level of gods who didn't use this type of device. They would use actually laser wielding ships and they would clean house with them, obviously. And there were huge consequences for this because after this, more and more of the Hollow Earth or 4D, there was a huge separation or rift between the two planes, so much so that the elders or the survivors 
put in place huge pillars that would commemorate it and also transmit telepathically messages to dissuade people to form this type of force. And after this, there was a beneficial turn of events because they were aware of their tumultuous past. So they were much more peaceful and only had one belief system, the Hyperboreans I'm speaking of. You must have heard of them. And also occupied about the same land. And they also diversified a lot, but this meant a lot of hybridizations further with ENKs. You would think that's a bad thing, but it's not. Eventually, that's the normal course. ENLs also, more and more of them, they would practically outlive their genetic code, at least in this plane. And when they would die, they would just go off to, well, they could go to ET planets, but they could also go just in Shambhala and never come back because they had a certain shelf life on Earth. Once they reached it, because they did, then they wouldn't have need for this. I mean, they couldn't even if they wanted to remain here. So that's why more and more you're going to find that ENKs gradually were dominating the world. And this diversity of the Hyperboreans was larger than what you have today on Earth. And there was a council at Teotihuacan, which is in Mesoamerica. And the pyramids that it's famous for were actually the type of architecture that belongs to Anunnaki, but not the originators of humanity, but another subspecies, which is around the Orion's belt. And the original ones were around the Sirius A star system. And the Sirius A ones style was actually represented by the Egyptian pyramids. And this is the Orion belts. There were also many other such buildings there at the time, but most of them have been leveled. And this council, which took place 27,000 years ago, is very significant because it marked out the allowing of the ENK peoples. It was kind of a bequeathing of the earth to them. It was noticeable that the ENLs were more and more departing. And each of the races that we know today happened as a result of a certain ET race that he's not allowed to disclose in this book, he says, because it'd probably be too controversial. They were assigned a certain ET species and a certain portion of the earth. And that's why we have the different races today. This happened in Teotihuacan. Because they noticed how the ENKs got more and more robust, not just physically, but also had a very strong charisma and also were quite witty as well, quite fast mentally. He mentioned also in the book that the longest of these civilizations of humanity were, first you had Lemurians, which was 40,000 years in length. Then you had Hyperboreans, which was 35,000 years. And the third longest was Atlantis, which was 25,000 years. And now I'm going to focus on Atlantis. This is a map of it. It included a huge continent that is now gone and a lot of islands around it. Most of the population was concentrated on the coasts of the islands, actually, but there was a lot inside the continent as well. And in the center of the continent, there was a huge city that had all these advanced pyramids and kind of what you hear about in the imagery of today. And it was very far ahead of what we have. And there were a lot of ETs around. But outside of the ETs, there were only ENLs. So it was an outpost of ENLs, kind of the last one, I would say. And pretty much the only land that survives now are the Azores and I want to say the Bahamas. Anyway, the reason for the strange Bermuda Triangle effect, apparently, is that so Atlantis had the equivalent of a third pole. It was a very strong magnetic field there. And that is very much travel to and fro Atlantis, including ET places. So the reason why this pole existed was very huge amounts of metal that are underground and they are still there. That's just an aside about the Bermuda. Now I'm going to explain. So they were very also refined. They were taller. They were represented by the symbol of the sun. And initially they had a yellow aura. And I'm now going to go into the reason for the split that everyone knows about, which was that in time, also it mentions just very briefly that there were some nefarious influences, but doesn't go into detail there. So it wasn't all just a natural event, I guess. But there was more and more difference between people that were high ranking in society, scientists. Now, on the other hand, you had kind of the wiser, the elders, the more spiritual oriented and 
the split got larger and larger and even their auras changed. So the scientists and more materialistically oriented people, even though they were much ahead of what we have today, they still had this kind of rift going. And they eventually got the reddish orange aura and the other ones got a light blue aura. So because they kind of could see that there was more and more division there, the blue aura people started to either, as I told you before, they would not reincarnate here on this plane anymore. They would just go for other places in 4D. Or they would do the right thing, which if they weren't ready to depart this plane, they would go to certain places on each continent to teach on because they pretty much saw what was coming. It was inevitable to keep these teachings alive. And for example, the outpost in Africa is Egypt, and they also went to South America and China and Eastern Europe and Central America. Now, for the reason for its destruction, obviously it was more and more dominated by the reddish orange aura people who did a very unthinkable act, which is they treated Ank ENKs as kind of secondhand citizens, if that, and they hybridized them with all sorts of other creatures just for the fun of it, which is like snakes and whatnot. That's where probably we hear the half man, half horse and centaur and such. And anyway, this had a very deleterious effect on them because they didn't account for the fact that these ENKs were actually their brethren. And when they would dumb them down, I mean, they would make them lesser. This would have a huge impact on them. You know, this is what happened. And the actual destruction, unlike what Plato said, it was an overnight destruction. There was such a thing as an overnight destruction, which was at the very end, but by the time it had been extremely severely decimated. And there are maps that show this. So the last one was indeed the Great Flood that everyone knows, the big event, which was, so if you want to know when Atlantis finally sunk, it was 13.5 a thousand years ago. But as much as a few thousand years back, there were already cataclysmic events because, from what I understood, it was not a flooding, but the opposite. The land would go down. It would sink. First of all, great swaths of it sank, but more and more until even the capital was underwater. And yeah, eventually there were no traces. So next he covers Egypt in a chapter, the making of the pyramids. He was curious just to get more specifics on the exact planning of this. So when he wanted to find details, he found a room where there were two Atlanteans and four ETs who were gathered. And in front of them, they had also huge holograms that were the size of a room, but they wouldn't just be limited to 3D. They would make calculations of constellations and such, because the express purpose of these buildings was just after the Atlantis sinking, they would be able to protect the ENKs that were remaining because they also underwent the calamity that covered the whole earth. It had two main objectives. One of them was to establish better communication with other planets, but the other was just to spread out very high frequencies that you could feed on. So it might look like they're kind of basic and anyone could do it, but not the case because, so he went in that vision, he saw that they were looking not just to to form the shapes because the outside does kind of look maybe a little rudimentary, but if you go to the blocks that are inside, they are so specific to the millimeter and they have to have certain angles as well that align to the stars. So you wouldn't find one that's alike, and that's impossible to do with even today's day. And also about how precise it is, how the offset of the peak is only six millimeters. And also a bit of confirmation is that they represent, even respecting the intensity, three of the main stars in Orion, the exact placement of the pyramid. So I guess that's what they mainly communicated with. And I should also add that the three main species that were considered our architects by this book are the Syrians from Sirius A, the Arcturians, and the Pleiadians. And the Arcturians look a little less like us, but the Pleiadians also could kind of pass for humans, same height as well. So after he saw the extent of the calculations and also the breadth of the project, because it was bigger than what we see today, yeah, he was blown away. And also you would think they could do this type of thing overnight, but it took 24 years because it wasn't a daily thing. It was periodic. So yeah, the date is 13,500 years. And then he saw how it was actually built. So no part of it was people lifting up anything. And also no part of it was actually ETs 
levitating stones either. What they had was a very streamlined process that included little and also larger ships that were each designated to a certain task. So you had the ones that would cut with the laser the blocks out of the quarry, which by the way, wasn't even in today's Egypt. I think it was in Libya. And the smaller drones, which had half spheres on their underbelly, each one would lift one block and they would go in a straight line. All of it was perfectly symmetrical and perfectly planned ahead. And there were be overseers that ensured that nothing went awry. And all the pyramids were actually done simultaneously as well. Now, when they were ready, they were different to today, obviously. They were very clean, very neat, very flat and white and kind of translucent. That's how it said. And they would have to be very powerful. And also the tops would be a different color and different material. Today's tops are gone. And he saw a vision of a few thousand years later where they were covered. At the time that they made them, it was lush jungle around it. But in time, they got actually covered in sand. But you still had priests and select few people that made sure that they kept the tradition going. And these are the guys who also knew all the chambers because there are so many. This is another level of intricacy to their insight. The chambers that each have certain purposes and none of which are tombs. <laughs> so, And he saw a vision where one priest also chanted something like the Indian in the Yosemites. And he could also teleport himself somewhere. Next, the Sphinx, which actually is older. It doesn't originate in the same project at all. And isn't just older, but is actually just a remnant, just a reminder from another town entirely, the older capital of Egypt, which was called Helanas or Helios. And actually now it's underwater because back then I told you the Mediterranean was smaller. The Nile barely even had a delta. It was pretty much just straight into the sea. And this Sphinx, and I should add that the inscription that you see between her paws, it describes how there are two Sphinx, or whatever the plural is. And that's exactly what was shown to him. There were two side by side of the Nile, as it was then not a delta. And it didn't have the head that it has today. It had a lion's head. And just a few things about Helanas. It was inhabited by ENLs, but also ETs. It had advanced tech. It was stone, but then it had kind of highlights of gold on the statues and sculptures and fountains and roofs. And it even had like a obelisk that was 70 meters tall. And on it was a five meter long sphere in the center of the town. They would light up without hurting your eyes, the entire town in a very nice glow. Anyway, once it sunk, because slowly, progressively, also the surroundings turned more desert-like. But they didn't mind it so much because they usually got upgraded. The Orient Elk creatures usually got a better deal. But by the time that the ETs that were overseeing the Egypt pyramid complex got wind of this statue, it was chest deep in water. The other one was completely submerged. So they just excavated it and planted it there, just as a memento. Okay. And then very briefly, what Troy was is the last outpost of what remained of the Hyperboreans. Its location was northwestern Turkey. And the reason for its importance was that it represented the very last place of transition between the etheric and the physical, which was guarded very safely in the center of the town. And once it fell, a lot of the old Troy fell as well inside. That's why all we see today are scant remains of it. And also very briefly about the Mayans, they managed to avoid the conquistadors by making a joint quick decision. When they figured out they were outnumbered and outgunned, all their elders gathered and they realized that they have to act fast. And I think they created intentionally this portal. And through it, they made a huge line. And the only concern they had was to be you know, found out by the invading Spanish forces. But as it turns out, the closer they got to this transition point, the closer that the effects of the etheric plane were, and they could even be 200 meters away and not know they're there. So their exodus was very efficient. They could squeeze in pretty much all of the thousands that were left at the time, because there weren't many at the time. And transported them. And in the case that they weren't quite up to snuff in terms of frequency of vibration or consciousness, 
then they would get a little boost from their priests. And at the end, the priests were the last ones to go in, and that's how it went, apparently. And the last tidbit of the book, it's very interesting that all these upgrades, including the formation of the humanity, which, as I said, was planned ahead, way ahead by galactic level entities. The reason for them is that a very distant event is going to happen billions of years away, which is the joining of Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies. And it's not like planets and stars can collide, but there's still going to be a ginormous kind of a fixing or a joining. And the best you can do is get ready for it, because if you don't match the frequencies of the two sets of inhabitants, then you're going to have to pay the price. They're doing their best to get to a sort of resolution, kind of a resonance. And yeah, that's the history of humanity, according to this book. And anyway, this last book, this is so awesome. I've taken so much notes. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> so the last book, which might be my favorite, just because it also goes into some of the SSPs, which is the only topic compared to this book, that's from what I found, that dwarfs this, obviously. But, you know, it's an unfair comparison. But this kind of information really is the best puzzle piece that you can grant all these accounts from the SSP people. Anyway. So you had the book that centered around the first tunnel and one that centered around the second tunnel, and now this is finally the third tunnel. But it doesn't actually go all the way. As you can see, this tunnel has a lot of ramifications, and one of them goes to Mork or the Carpathian Mons, which is very near, but he goes to the middle one, which is a room in Iraq, which is similar to the occult room in Egypt, but smaller and very important as well. So unlike the other ones, he could actually just portal through Whenever there was a ramification, there was an outset of portals. But the point is, you could get to, to Iraq from Romania in like a matter of minutes. That's how little it would take. And you couldn't abuse this too much because it would have effects on your mitochondria, apparently. the tested out. But seasoned veterans like Cesar, they went through this so fast, he got a costume. So anyway, this is a picture of the inside of the occult room from Iraq. Also had these kind of tablets on the walls. And they couldn't interpret them at first. They were very different. And they were crystal, not metals. And eventually, I think they got to them, but they didn't focus on them at all. What they focused on is this special chair. And unlike the chairs from the other rooms, they couldn't really access this because it had multiple components and they were made to fit a body that was 2.5 meters. So anyway, the power source, the main power source of this was this crystal that the book is titled after. The problem is they didn't have access to it, or so they thought. The reason why, actually, in the first place, he got those goggles from the Apelos people was because they appealed to them for help in this matter because they wanted to localize this crystal, thinking they would maybe find it in the walls. So he used the 4D mode to scour around for it. And sure enough, it was right where it was supposed to be, only it wasn't visible. It was completely invisible. But they still couldn't make use of the chair. And he goes into the effect that the crystal had on him, which is clearly a very powerful thing there. But I'm just going to skip to the... so. He got a download. This is not so unusual. He even makes a comparison, the editor, I think, that Maria Orsic pretty much designed all those Hannibal ships just simply by receiving the information without actually technical nows having any herself. So he got a, not just download, actually, he had a huge block download spurred on by this crystal and also the goggles. And it told him all this symbology and all this advanced quantum physics that he wouldn't make heads or tails of at the beginning, but slowly and slowly using the goggles and using the replay mode, which allowed him to go back to the chair in Iraq to inspect it again, the symbology on it, and also all the visions that he had before that he now had access to. So he basically did enough to figure out what it kind of represented, but he felt it on his cortex. So all this information was there. He just had to tap in and kind of make the other side of the brain, you know, attuned to it. So what he did was a side project to his usual duties in Department Zero, which I forgot to mention that by the time of the fifth book, he's now second in command. He has access to all this stuff. He could go to project room like on his own time. He can do whatever. Only Cesar is ahead of him. And they're very close. They're very close friends. And so he named this project that he was very set on establishing Project Eden. And it turns out that what he was seeing 
was the equivalent of the chair in Iraq, but fit to the technology and to the size requirements for him. And it included all these metals, all these schematics, and all these configurations and proportions, including down to the level of, so you can see the tips of this device here are certain crystals, and it explains all that. And for this, it wasn't a one-man job at all. So he had to recruit people, and he did have access to kind of the cream of the crop, including one hack, not hacker. Yeah, he was a benign hacker who would kind of go through like butter through all these three-letter agencies and just explain to them what was wrong with their security. And when he was invited to go overseas and work for them, he just said he had everything he wanted in Romania. So he managed to persuade this guy who was called Midas, nicknamed, to be on board. And he did the software side because what this turned out to be was kind of a biofeedback machine that so you would read you out perfectly all the changes inside your body and it would invoke fluctuations, energetic kind of jolts in you. They would be very, very attuned and specific. The purpose being to control, well, to project yourself in space and time. But you'll come to find that it's very different to, for example, the consciousness time machine from the Egypt room. And it's totally novel and it's very cool because obviously there wouldn't be a book if it didn't work out. So then it's explained to him by Repa Sundi, who is talking to him again, how what we see behind an apple is actually nothingness because all you see is the feedback, the visual feedback that comes back to your eyes. And behind it, literally, I mean, generally nothing. So other than what you see here, what you hear, there is just a vastness, an emptiness of space. And you have to get behind that, that it's all illusion. And you're seeing just the folds on the surface. And also, even the constants that are, you know, considered sacred and such, like pi, the number pi, even that changes. And there's no such thing as a constant. And the reason being that there's no such thing as a perfect circle in the universe, or a sphere, obviously. And just for a quick explanation for this, imagine a compass that draws what appears to be a perfect circle, but the graphite on the pen end does diminish and doesn't come back to the exact part of the circle. You know, so it's basically a spiral. Yeah, I know, like the point, yeah, yeah, the point of that compass, you know, or the graphite, it's, it's I, I know what you mean, I'm picking up what you're saying, very minute, but, and even if that weren't so, even if it's digital or something, the inception of the circle takes place in another point in time than when it's ended. So that right there renders it not a circle because parts of it are in different points of time. Anyway. Talking about relativity and, and time. It, yeah, it does. Also, even our interpretation of quantum mechanics is not there completely because our kind of perception of the world is that it's, a uh, result of you know chance whereas that's just because that's what we want to see and even the trajectory of the electrons that have been correctly interpreted to not be a circle but kind of an oval even those change trajectory ever so slightly but it's a difference that makes all the difference i mean yeah so anyway this is some of the syrian symbols and they have a very simplistic but very all-encompassing language and he saw this also in the historical holograms. So it's very much just based on dots and lines, but it takes a... The top kind of, half looks like constellations. The bottom half looks like hieroglyphs. What you need to remember is that the vertical lines have to do with the advancement of the beings and entities in the universe. And the horizontal line has to do with time and repetition and such. You're going to see, for example, so... This one would mean us, like kind of on lower on the spectrum, that are kind of aspiring to be godlike. This would be interpreted as God, but also middling creatures like, for example, the advanced aliens that made us, who exert their influence on us, the lower beings. And this is the K, and you can see the different types of Ks. This is the Pi, as you can see, it underwent a bit of a transformation there. And this is the reason why I include this, because they also had to choose the correct time in terms of stars alignment to start this project, because, yeah, I told you, astrology is very real. And also to kind of be in the right for the room that they're doing this in, which is Eleanor's, the alchemist's basement. They're using it as a makeshift place at first. This is called, the symbol is called Shikara, and it means vital energy that comes from divine light. And they had this engraved in a noble metal on the ground under the device. 
And anyway, he has a lot more explanations about the language, which is very interesting, you should check out. The first experiments were quite rough. So he kind of had a vague idea of what he wanted, but the shifts in states were too abrupt. And that's why they looked for all these possible problems in the code that Midas designed in the software. And one of the main characters of the book figures out that it was because Midas had limited one of very important parameters that had to do with Radu's particular frequency signature, that it stopped to the first five numbers, which it should have gone on and on. And the reason why programmers sometimes limit to the first five numbers is that they just want to save like computational power and things like this. But once they figured this out and he kind of felt, you know, silly for this oversight, because this just goes to show that we're dealing with technology that goes beyond the physical plane. In this case, the etheric and a little bit the astral. You have to be extremely precise. That's why they call them subtle energies, because you're going inside. You have to be extremely exact. And it pays to be. And they were struggling for a long time, not just in this sense, technologically, but also with finances, because all these medals and all these salaries that they had to pay on the side, because this was surreptitiously done at first, not officially at all, were saved by the arrival of Eleanor, the alchemist, who, once he got all the information about the project, she was fond of it, and he offered to finance it with his vast, you know, wealth and they got to the point where he could be asleep he felt like he was asleep on the device he would do these training sessions on his own usually he got used to it because he had this tablet next to him he could set all the parameters and the you know fluxes of energy that he wanted and then he would enter sleep mode like sleeping stage all the making of it at the same time he would feel as aware he would on the day to day level and when he told this to Cesar, he said that he made his first excursion into the etheric plane, but this was still very rudimentary and early on. So because he consulted about his progress with Eleanor, Eleanor told him that he should be more purified physically or healthy, which would in turn make him able to last longer and also go deeper in his trips. But he wasn't quite content with this. So knowing his history of alchemy, he asked him for some sort of booster, which he gave him in this elixir. Actually, not an elixir. He made the point that it's not even, a, it's kind of a middling potion, an extract, but a perfect extract, like only the quintessence, I mean, the very, very best vital part of a certain plant that I forget. And he gave it to him and it registered huge changes straight away that would last years. It, it just made him, basically, it, it cut four years off his process of purification which was an exact calculation that was made later on. That's why I'm not pulling it out of the ether. It was made by the Apollos people who were curious into what these changes in his body were. So all of a sudden, during the experiments, he gets to see something entirely new, which were visions also of the history of the humanity. But there were details that had hitherto not been known even to the Apollos people. And that's why they contacted them. And they were actually surprised as well. And what they did was... They went back to the holographic device that he got the older info for book six for. And because he was now acquainted with this new event that happened in the past two of them, one in Council of Teotihuacan that I mentioned, another I forget. So because he had access to them, he could now project himself in the time. And he had witnesses on his side that could verify that those things did happen were not a product of his imagination. So this got them an invite and better and better relations with the Apelos people which it turns out is a 4D world, even though Thomas is way further down, just the day-to-day -day and quality of life, and just the nobility of the people and just their being. And also the level of technology, which uh, were mind-blowing, it would be like, instead of working in front of a monitor, even this picture doesn't make it justice. So their monitors basically were on the ground, they were slightly curved, and they were taller than them and wider. So two meters tall and three meters long, and they would do all the work in front of them. And they would just gesticulate, or even apparently the main input mode was voice. And he got into this laboratory. He got talking to Mentia, who is also a 30 year old looking, but actually 40 something year old, who was the head of the research center there. She was very much into biology, physics, but most of all, her mission was to get real medicine up on the surface. But you can do that any which way. You had to tread carefully, not get too ahead of yourself. And this she saw as a perfect avenue. She saw these changes in his DNA, in Radu's DNA, and wanted to figure out why, and realized that just a machine which did its part was not going to be enough. 
So she got to the bottom of the fact that he had taken this elixir, uh, this essence, and wanted to know more and more. And she only knew the basic principles of alchemy, but she wasn't really clued into it. And she was amazed by it, although they were so ahead of us. But yeah, also when Elinor was told of these inner earth peoples, he was not surprised at all and told him that he had been to Shambhala as well. So these very high level alchemists are very in the know. Now he got more and more familiar with Mentia. She even requested that she met Elinor. And so she met him in Bucharest because she does go overground a lot, it turns out. She told him of five other underground cities that are also much closer, so not down low like Tomasis, who throughout the ages have protected and otherwise helped Romanians. And that's apparently why, after being conquered by so many different civilizations, because we do change the leaders every hundred years or so, it still persisted and it still has its identity. And after hundreds of years of Hungarians being in charge of us, we still haven't gotten a single word in our language from the Hungarians. So that's kind of an interesting tidbit. So this is an example of a real hybrid. Her father or mother, I forget, was from one of these underground cities. And that made her a certain personality type that gave her the status of a hero because she died very young. She was the head of this platoon in World War I. And she entered the you know, annals of history through that. I just wanted to show you a glimpse of what they look like, which is not Apelos, it's a different town. So she goes to the villa of Eleanor and they have a long discussion all of Mentia, Eleanor, Cesar, and Radu. And she basically puts forward this proposal that instead of a slow drip of their tech, which would be a little too jarring, and would have to compromise, they would have to disclose and arrange with a lot of diplomacy and bureaucracy through the governments. That's how it is with tech. That's why she proposed that through this alchemy that would completely bypass, it would transform you completely. So this is a middling one and it did so much. You can imagine what an elixir does. And we should put forth that all that would be needed is in the ointments and other such natural medicine that is so ineffectual, but still all right. They would sleep in, just squeeze in some drops of micro drops of the level of essences that were given to Rado. And this way, because her mission was, she had noticed how badly the DNA of a lot of sects of humanity had degraded. And she actually pointed out that Scandinavians in particular, Nordics, uh, have very badly almost to the point of disrepair, damaged DNA. And she didn't mention other names. And she insists, she doubled down on this when she was challenged because Radu told her that, but I thought they were kind of sturdy people. Not, apparently not. And I heard this from another place, which is interesting. But when she puts this forth, Eleanor kind of shuts, I mean, snubs this because she tells her that it's not as easy as you think for many, many reasons, namely that alchemy takes lifetimes of experience. You couldn't teach it if you wanted to. It's all experience. So if you are ill-intended during the making of it, it's going to have effects on the power of that initial intention. Or it's just not going to come out at all. That's, I think, the more likely scenario that you have to be in the right frame of mind. And it takes much more than reading books, which are very, so of the hundreds or thousands of books and alchemy, the very, very select few are even relevant. And those are full of lies and kind of tests that you need to pass. Intentional, you know, difficult. Pitfalls. Yes, exactly. And the other reason why it's an impossibility is that the law of non-intervention, which apparently goes back to the inception of humanity, it's mentioned there very briefly in book six, where the reason behind it is not just to protect us, but to ensure that there is enough of a um, variety, diversity, and strength, vigor, that would ensure we live up to our potential. So this law of non-intervention means that you can't just hand people the answer. You can't just, you know, spoon feed them because no good would ultimately come out of it. And you're playing with the laws of karma. But seeing that she was very, very insistent and also acknowledging that her purpose was completely the right one. They came to a kind of accord, but at that point, Eleanor lets the others know that they have to leave the room and speak with Mentia herself, so we don't know about that. But he said that he, in later volumes he would speak at length about this, so that's good that there will be more. Okay, now this makes a abrupt turn to, now that he had his act together around Project Eden, he could make consistent trips wherever he wanted, so unlike the Egypt device, he could just imagine a place and pretty much within limit, you know, within reason, 
but he could, if he knew the place, he would absolutely go there. And also, the more he explored places, the more he just wanted to go to the next one, next one. And so he got to complexify. And at one point, he got to this U.S. base that was in the desert. He recognized that it wasn't S4 because during his earlier adventures in America, when he did remote viewing, he was shown a dossier that showed pictures from S4, and he could ascertain that it wasn't that. Still didn't know where. And he saw uh, TR-3B that was being loaded with all this cargo. And there were a chain of people, also not just military. And the TR-3B was slightly rounded, so it wasn't sharp edged. And he also described some other parts of the bases, but he focused on this. And at one point, one of the people down under the ship catches wind of him and turns in his direction and sends him kind of a message. But at that point, he, he was completely out of his element and just came back, you know, with a bank. And he told Cesar of this, that he was recognized in 4D. And Cesar told him that the best we can do, knowing that the guy saw him and probably has the means to track him, that it would be wise to let the people that they are closest to in this know that they spied on them, essentially, so that they wouldn't be considered suspect because they had enough problems or enough pressures already. So lots of time later and a lot of deliberation. And because of his spotless record, he managed to contact these guys who turns out was the most occult and obscured part of the Pentagon. They had some affiliation with it, but through their other links, they managed to track them and they confirmed that they did indeed find them. And they weren't mad or anything. They just probed each other. They wanted to just suss out information about each other just through letters until one point it became clear that what they wanted, the Americans, was to find out why their device, because they had an equivalent device, why their device was faulty. So they actually revisited the Romanian base. And by this time, they had gotten sponsorship. They still had complete control of it, but they had gotten a lot of more funds because they had to go official once they disclosed the stuff. They couldn't hide anymore. And anyway, that was the tough part, but Chesil, it eventually came through. So the, their base was visited and they were very impressed, even though it was a little lower tech than theirs. So once they saw that it was a real deal, they got invited to their underground city because although we know about the dams, they still rely on huge openings, which none of these caverns that I mentioned actually are excavated because that would be too arduous considering the many caverns that already exist. So they connect these huge grottos and they build cities inside them. So they got invited to their base through an airplane that looked a little futuristic and it said that, so this would have been the American desert. So it took them from Romania to the American desert, less than four hours to get there, which is still a lot, but yeah, it's something. And they knew that they were the highest level of security because they didn't even have to show any ID or verification of any kind. They just flew in. So anyway, they were taking inside this underground city and they were told not to disclose anything about its layout and where it is and what it's like. I mean, very vague description. So this twin project, which they weren't even allowed to call out by name, they had to see for themselves what was wrong with it. And so he mounted it, Radu, who Project Eden was tailor-made for him, so he was the commander. So he went in and he noticed that it was more high-tech, better put together and just, we were surrounded the whole room by these men in white coats. And he got inside and he noticed that the transitions, he did indeed go into the etheric plane, but it was extremely jarring. He could see that his vision was totally altered and it was perceived different lights than what he would normally. But both the getting there and getting back were very unpleasant. And then he let them know that it needs to be much more fine-tuned, that you need to guide it around a single person because they were going around anyone. So anyone could use it in their mind. And then Cesar, who was also in the strip, makes a very astute observation that, oh, once the Americans told him that the basis of the machine was actually artificial intelligence of a very advanced variety, he told him that once AI gets to a certain complexity, that it's necessarily ensouled by something that feels affinity towards it. Now, the problem is, if you don't have sacred numbers and proportions within this AI, you will attract negative entities. And that's the reason why it wasn't cooperating. So he said that 
And the guys listening were extremely dead serious. It didn't flinch once and were taking every word. And they were skeptical at first and just did some more questioning there. But eventually it turned out completely dead on. And they got invited again after years of adjustments. And this time, so it wasn't quite as smooth, but it still felt like it formed a suit around him, just the frequency. So it was much better than the first time around. And on their second visit there, Radu managed to visit the moon. The reason why he went to the moon was that in his initial vision of the TR-3B, he got a telepathic read that that was the destination. So that was the natural course, him just wanting to find out more about the moon and the bases. And what he did was using these portals that he would actually see in this place, a cluster of them. And it was obvious that it wasn't quite up to snuff yet, the device, because some of them would go in and out, but still was much improved. And for example, you could have a portal that would go from here to the moon and you would know it beforehand where it would go approximately. And he went to the moon base. The first one was kind of simple, just a couple of horizontal cylinders connected by three tunnels. But he got the read that it was a human base and it was inside a crater, but not in the center. Then another two kind of different architecture, but also human, clearly human bases. And I think one of them was on the dark side of the moon and two of them were not. And he next goes to an ET base, which was clearly different because it was a different material, smooth, it had a smooth surface and just a different geometry. And he approached it and thought that it went inside much more than outside, much, much more. He basically got lost in there. It was so enormous. There were rooms that were big and small, but there were staircases that he could not see the end of. And then he just jumped back. He got kind of jolted back in the seat because he was dying to get to the bottom of this moon thing. So anyway, he got back to Romania. He got into the Eden chair, which was now very well put together through the extra funds. He could replace the rare metals like rhodium, which I think is the most expensive of all metals. And he jumped to all these hoops, just went straight to the heart of it, which was, so it starts with chronologically, a proto-civilization of the Syrians that also have made us. They had bigger eyes, smaller mouths, but other than that, they would clearly the progenitors of the latter Syrians because they had the same type of walk and, you know, poise and kind of higher purpose and nobility and respect for nature. And he saw that even as far back as them, they would have motherships that were the size of planets or small planets. And he saw kind of the beginnings of terraforming. He had to see this to understand what happened around here with the moon and everything. He saw that they had a failed terraforming experiment where they had expected too much of the flora and fauna. They didn't adjust the tempo of the atmosphere. You have to gel them together. And then all the vegetation caught on fire and they had to wait thousands of years until they could do it properly. So that was just a bit of experience, trial and error for them. And then it cuts to Earth, specifically the last of the dinosaur, uh, no, 100 million years ago. So I think the Cretaceous era was in full bloom that time. And it showed that even though there was a lot of life on Earth, there was not even grass, there were ferns, there were a lot of pine trees, a lot of pine forests, and obviously reptiles, a lot of them, but only reptiles and insects. And th there are some variety there, but it had completely stagnated. So the reason for this is cosmic dust that engulfed completely, not just the atmosphere on the Earth, but also the camera zoomed out and he saw Earth from 800 kilometers away and saw that it was completely surrounded in this cosmic dust. And it made it so none of these creatures ever even saw the sun. It was only like a sandstorm, so reddish orange or yellowish orange. And that's all they ever saw. And obviously it cost them in terms of evolution. And this was the reason for their intervention. They also noticed what I mentioned earlier about how Earth is kind of in this perfect sweet spot where there's not a lot of abrupt events cosmically going on, which allows for free flow of life. And they saw the potential of it, but they had to take care of this dust. So they came down on Earth and the sign that they were pretty compatible to it was the fact that all they needed was just a breathing mask and they were fine. But they took samples, and after they took some samples from flora and fauna, they noticed that they were actually a little off, that there was a lot of complexity in this life. 
the trouble is it had reached a standstill, but basically they recognized the potential much more so than before. And so they doubled their efforts and they singled out Orma, who is a woman in her 40s, mid 40s apparently she looked like, who had this plan, her very complex vision. She was kind of a biologist, but they would encompass much more sciences than we would ever perceive. And she had this vision of a force field that would both level up you know the dna of the world but also take care of the dust and there were several solutions suggested at first one of them was because jupiter is gaseous they thought it would be no great compromise to take one of its moons and place it around orbit of the earth and it would kind of serve this duty but they figured out that it wouldn't be right on the rest of the jupiter and the surrounding moons because each play the role and the other suggestion was taking Well, another type of celestial body, I forget what, something to do with the way that water looks inside at the singularity point of a planet. It looks black, the water, there is water, which is the foundation of it, but it's a different type of water than normal surface water. And you know this because he saw even the bonds, atom bonds of the water were different angles. And this is what caught my attention was that this water was black. And something tells me that this may or may not have something to do with black goo that that's the origin of black goo because we know that earth had this black goo deposits that's just why i wanted to mention that but anyway they went to their elders for advice and they suggested that because this ship that they had used to explore earth was also this mother ship that was thousands of years in use already and it was kind of on its last legs that they actually convert it to do the force field mission and as well as the attraction of the dust Obviously, they had to up the ante of the gravity to attract all the dust. But it turns out that the moon is actually, like Nibiru, but different, a 100 million year old Syrian ship. And the reason why it's covered in those craters is because it has, I want to say, 20 kilometers worth of crust. And that crust is not the same level everywhere. Sometimes it's up to twice that. And all that crust is, is cosmic dust that has been attracted purposefully from the Earth's surroundings. And this, you could say, is kind of a sacrifice, as well as with the Syrians that seeded us. I don't think it's, I think the junk DNA and all the dumbing down, it did happen. This book doesn't really go into the Babylon and this type of thing. But you have to respect this guy's commitment to galactic level movements. And they're, you know, wanting to accelerate evolution, but not go against any of nature's laws. And this is the last part, that what the asteroid belt is, I don't even want to specify the current theory because it's so wacky. Just looking to it is ridiculous. Even the editor acknowledges it, which the editor takes this as science fiction, but that's just because they're obliged to. So anyway, the asteroid belt, what that was, was I told you how Jupiter is gaseous, but the one that was telluric, that was the biggest, was called Tiamat, or I think Marduk, Maldek, sorry. And it was between Mars and Jupiter, and it was very large, something comparable to Neptune, I think, but bigger. And it doesn't say how. So one of the few blocks that are inside the book, one of them was when they wanted to find out who the makers of the projection hole were, but they covered their tracks and they couldn't go back figure that out. One of the other blocks was how Maldek got destroyed. He couldn't look into it. It was denied, but it did get destroyed and it gets splintered off into all these little pieces. And that's what happened that didn't directly, you would think that the crater down in Mesoamerica, it's a Yucatan, I think, was what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, but it was actually just the lack of the presence of Maldek that caused that because the reptiles were very attuned to this planet. And after that, you still find dinosaur bones five to 10 million years later, but they were weaker. So they couldn't live on. And another piece of confirmation that this asteroid belt was what it was, was that Ceres and Vesta and the other bigger chunks of Ceres even counts as a small planet, planetoid, as well as certain moons of Jupiter that wouldn't make sense to be there because of their size. Usually you have the smaller moons next to the planet, then the bigger ones at the middle, and then small ones again at the outskirts. But in this case, you have very big ones at the outskirts. 
And that's because some of Maldek's moons either got attracted to Jupiter or are actually Ceres and Vesta and the other 500 kilometer in diameter bodies that are in the asteroid belt and stand out because of how big they are compared to the other particles, which are way smaller. They really jut, you know, like a sore thumb. So, yeah, it turns out the moon is an alien ship. And that's pretty much the end of this seven book cycle.